I have the ability. I have, I have pushed the button. <laughs> 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 All right. Start the clock. How long is this cold open going to be? Uh, well, I it hope it's 30 minutes. It depends on whether or not Keith is into cameras, because otherwise... It- <laughs> <laughs> If if Keith is just if if Keith doesn't give a shit about cameras, then we ain't got nothing to cold open about. <laughs> oh man, I know Jack's shit about cameras. So. Well, what are you recording How about on, it, gentlemen? What what are you recording on now? What is uh what is your webcam of choice? I'm on a MacBook Pro. That's that's my that's camera son. choice. Yes, yeah, son. Yeah, yeah. I, w- yeah. With, a, with a lamp in front of me. <laughs> So you don't yep, have right a there. you don't have a giant ass scrim in front of you to like <laughs> soften the light or like a like another lamp this, over here to get this nice bounce this, thing. This is my like natural. This is my natural skin tone. You don't have a ring light to just like do it like the 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 YouTube vloggers and shit. Do you see the shit I deal with every week? I get this <laughs> camera envy because I look at this beautiful lighting and I'm like. This God, he's so pretty, and I am so angry about it every week. No, yeah, I, 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 my favorite part of the podcast every week is when you guys kiss my ass and call me the boss. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Trust me, we'll get there because I feel like I've done something wrong. Because anytime you show up, I know I've overstepped somehow. Or it's just like, no, son, sit down. Adults are talking right now. Brandon, you need to just go sit Brandon. in the fucking corner. No, Fair. That is the proper way to handle me, by the way. Roll up a newspaper and smack me in the nose and just sit me in a corner. Like, <laughs> let me educate you about the world, son. Like, oh, <laughs> the, the, the stacker Pentecost finger of like, you <laughs> keep talking. <laughs> yeah, no, we're canceling the, sec- the apocalypse tonight. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, Jamie, second boss leaves, reset the clock. <laughs> <laughs> reset the clock. Oh. God, I wish I wish I wish that Second movie was better, man. I wish I liked Pacific Rim at all. Out of our podcast, right the fuck now. <laughs> you see? You see this shit? Yeah. How, how dare you, Keith Chow? How dare you? I know dare- why. I know why. Because he didn't watch it when we saw it. Like, if, if you saw the movie when we saw it with us in that room where everyone was shouting at the screen, I think your opinion of the film would change. For sure. You know what it is? I I think I wish John Boyega was in the first one and Garrett Hedlund was he the one that's in it? I don't know. I get Garrett Hedlund and all those other white dudes that look like him mixed up. Who the fuck is Garrett Hedlund? Is he the the white dude in the movie? Uh, or is it a, was it a different white dude? It in was. The movie? I think. Oh, Jesus. I thought, I thought that was Charlie Hunnam. Charlie, they, Hunnam. they're the same guy. Look at him. Garrett, Garrett, Garrett Hudlin was in Garrett. The Garrett guy was in the Tron movie. Yeah. In the Hun- Charlie look, Hunnam is, is in, was in Pacific Rim. Okay. Yeah. Look him up. They're literally the same person. <laughs> I've never seen them in a film together. Look so at a maybe, photo of the maybe. both of them. They are the same person. <laughs> so point is, I think if Boyega was in the first one instead of the, I guess, Charlie Hunnam, um, I would have liked the first one more, maybe. Mm, I could, I could see that because I didn't like him. I, I didn't like that he was the the star of the movie. Oh yeah, I mean he was he was there was he he gave us nothing. But the first one has Stacker Pentecost and Mako Mori and a goddamn sword coming out of an what? arm. So okay, hang hang on, hang on, hang on. I will concede one hundred percent that John Boyega is way better than Charlie Hunnam, but your replacement is the fucking guy from Tron. No, no, no. I, I think they're the same person. I oh, can't okay. tell the difference. I was about he has to say, face like, he was Garrett Hedlund. He has face no, that's, that's totally yeah. fine. Yeah, like, <laughs> if, if we're talking about the version from Four Brothers, Gareth Hedlund, I'm here for it. But the second he gets into that Tron verse, I'm like, no. <laughs> when it comes to those dudes, it's hashtag all look same. Oh. No, I get this. I can't. No. <laughs> nah, I, I get this. What is it? Uh, Scott Eastwood, the one who showed right. up the in the, the, one in the fast movie. Like yeah. yeah, yeah. Scott put all three of them in a movie, and, and I would 
you I wouldn't be able to <laughs> like it's like the, it's like the mirrors and in, in, there's a the dragon i can't tell who's who there are three people on screen but they all look the same i don't understand <laughs> yeah. i have like weird 3d why does, glasses why does the director keep cutting between the same guy like just <laughs> right yeah reverse there, smash cut it, the same guy i don't get yeah. it there's gonna be a comedy scene where like the three of them are sitting at a dinner table together or something like that and he's gonna be watching and be like this is like the clump shit where like the one guy plays three people his yeah. shit is good cg is real yeah. good <laughs> It's deep fake technology. They all look the right, same, yeah. but they don't. But they do. But they don't. But they do. And then, and then the 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 bad guy from Logan, I swear, oh. is, is one of them. And he's not. He's like a fourth dude. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, <laughs> oh wait, wait, wait. Okay, Lo- Logan. The dude with the metal arm, in Logan. Oh, uh, wasn't that? Is that? Is that Bill Burr? Let me see. Let me see. That's not wow. Bill Burr. Uh, uh, Boyd Holbrook. Boyd sure. Holbrook. That doesn't even sound like a real name. <laughs> sure. <laughs> that's he's a, not a real yeah. person. He's literally like a deep fake. Like Jamie said, they just deep fake Charlie Hunnam. The the algorithm came up with that name. We need a generic. <laughs> we need a generic yeah, actor yeah, yeah. name that we can stick in here. Well, yeah, he's like low budget. He's like GoBots Draco Malfoy is what he is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put the four of them in the same movie and yeah, like, and I, I don't think, know if the screen can see that, but oh, yeah, yeah, there's there's your boy. Yeah. Like uh Wait, which one is that? <laughs> is that the Logan guy? <laughs> yeah, that that's the guy from Stand By Me. <laughs> it's like a like a uh, a nondescript Sean Penn, like a real bad like if you were drawing Sean Penn, but you're not good at like distinguishing facial anatomy and you, stuff. You know what Boyd Holbrook looks like is Macaulay Culkin if he wasn't on the drugs? <laughs> But you got to find a picture of him in Logan because, like, that's like a red carpet photo of him. Like, in Logan, I swear he's Charlie Hunnam or Garrett Hedlund or uh, let me, Scotty. Let me see, let me like, see. he's it's uh, the images. same dude. They was, just that guy, was that guy in, um, uh, oh God, was he in Narcos? I don't know. I don't know. But yeah. we, here's the other thing we need those four dudes in the movie with Margot Robbie, Samara Weaving, Jamie King, and, and like. <laughs> There's there's another <laughs> actress who looks just like them. <laughs> it'll be and and every scene it'll be like the different couple, but you wouldn't be able to tell. It's like, what, right. what movie am I watching? <laughs> oh yeah, the other one is uh, the 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 actress from Community, Gillian Jacobs. Oh yeah yeah yeah. No, if we got oh, all yeah. of them, the four okay, so, of them are the same person as well. So hear me out. There's a Wes Anderson movie set in Scandinavia where Peter Starsgard is the father, and they're all of his kids. <laughs> God damn. Oh man. And it's got that everything is has is framed in that like Wes Anderson bullshit way and that like the yeah. Color, yeah. <laughs> like a music box or like, it's like Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm 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 casting a white movie for a white ass audience. It is, is really it is peak caucasity right there. That's the <laughs> the movie is called caucasity. That's what the movie is called. It's just mm. So that's the camera I'm using. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 720p macbook pro yeah I, I, that's my I, lens that that's what that's what you're that's what you're rocking with uh brandon chalmers sure. hit me with the spot man Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is once again the starting time for what you and I both lovingly call the fucking do a cast. Part of the Hard Knock Media Podcasting Network that is NOC is in Nerds of Color. Jamie, hit them with the website. Where can they find them? www.hardknockmedia.com. Founded by, I, I don't know where this is going to be, where I am in this video. I guess I'm to Keith's. I'm right here. Left. So founded <laughs> by our, our guest host for this evening, one Keith Chow. Keith, can you introduce yourself to those who are unfamiliar with you? I am who they lovingly call the boss man. 
Uh, I don't know why. I don't know how I got that moniker, but I'll go. I'll run with it. Yeah, dude, only runs the fucking podcast you network. Founded the on, network, and, dude. Oh, yeah, founded the podcast network. I don't understand how he got the name <laughs> bought. Like, doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Shut us down if I step out of line. <laughs> That's why I'm here, Brandon. Borrowed time. Borrowed <laughs> time. You, you, you put us on the list, man. You put us on the list. Like, no, I lo- I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm glad I did. I love having you guys on the network. You, uh, I, and I, I just love the self-deprecation every time you introduce yourselves as part of the Hard Knock. We didn't. Uh, here's the thing. Like, you guys, the other podcasts are not nearly as boring as they, as they claim they are. <laughs> <laughs> like we're, we're not like we're not like lecture like history lectures no but um, the the stuff you guys cover is a lot more relevant <laughs> to like current events than the bullshit we talk about yeah <laughs> nobody's fucking learning anything from me and if they do they shouldn't yeah like that's just a rule hmm. yeah the the hard knock life isn't uh the most educational podcast either i just want to <laughs> say <laughs> We, ah, like, trying we, to get we, those we like kids talking, back. We, we just talk about Batman and, uh, uh, you know, stupid shit. Do you, do you talk about how Bruce Wayne could end poverty in Gotham City? Or, oh, yeah. Or- the, 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 last, the last episode. Well, the, the, we, we're on a brief hiatus right now. Uh, that's why I'm on this podcast. I was like, I needed to be oh. on the podcast. <laughs> oh. <laughs> going into withdrawals. <laughs> I, I, I need the, the, I need the like, podcast fixed. <laughs> yeah. I haven't heard an intro in like six weeks. This shit ain't right. <laughs> uh, but our last episode, our last live episode was uh, about, you know, Joel Schumacher just passed away. Yes. And the same day they announced Michael Keaton was coming back to the DC movie universe. So like we oh, had a yeah. whole episode about, about Batman. Uh, but yeah, talking about how, two things about Batman. One, like rewatching the Schumacher movies after he passed, like you realize they're, it's not that they're not as bad as people thought they were, but I think the context is different because what we talked about on the podcast and, and we called it Batman Pride Forever is that Batman Forever and Batman and Robin are really like, you know, through the lens of a queer director. And, mm-hmm. and okay, it's kind of like, you know, the camp and camp, you know, we, a lot of fanboys uh, dismiss camp, but camp is such an integral part of a lot of queer culture. Mm-hmm. And, and like, you know, the Schumacher Batman movies take camp to a whole new level. Oh yeah, they do. <laughs> and, yeah. and, I, and I think there's a, there's a, there's like a reappreciation of that, I think. Um, and then so many people like we dismiss because we're old heads, but a lot of people grew up on those Batman movies. It's kind of like the prequels, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I, I am a Schumacher defender because I think they're the best sequels to 66 Batman yeah, yes, there right, could yes. possibly be. And if you enjoy Batman. 66 Batman for what it is and then go and watch the other ones, you're like, it's the same shit. It's mm-hmm. perfect. Even, and it's great. Even the Burton one, and that's the other thing we talked about is like the Burton movies are not these dark, gritty Batman movies when you go back and watch. Like, I don't Especially, know, man. Like, if you watch Danny DeVito in that second one, sure, that's, yeah. some, that's some, like, yeah. Like, it's, if you it's, slow-mo watch him eat a fish, with the that, is, that is something <laughs> oh, that belongs God. on the dark web. Like, please yeah. understand. But I guess, I guess, yeah, you're right. But it's, like, it's, it's 60s Batman through, like, Burton's macabre lens. But it's yeah. still very much, like, you know, it's still, you can see the straight line from Adam West. To Burton to Schumacher, it's not yeah. these like for sure. Leaks yeah, that people assume it. They, that right. They are. Yeah. 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 And then the other thing was Nolan we were talking like, about how. Ooh. Well, yeah, and then the other thing was that we talked about how it like swung back, and the Nolan movies, you know, for all the praise that they get, are are basically cop propaganda and <laughs> and the Dark Knight cop, propaganda, propaganda, and the Dark Knight rises as as prescient as it was with like mask wearing and and you know putting the rich on trial. It ends, the climax is Batman, you know, amasses this giant cop army <laughs> to take down, you know, Occupy Wall Street. So mm-hmm. uh, it hits different in 2020 for sure. Yeah. I never liked that one that much anyway to begin with. Uh, because of all of that, but also the bullshit climbing scene, motherfucker. <laughs> there, are 12 year olds, there, there are 12 year olds who are starting out at the climbing gym who could have soloed that bullshit cave in like 10 minutes and sure, fucking Batman at the peak of from his a physi- broken back. Well, he had yeah. a broken back. Well, okay. He fixed his back and he couldn't figure out how to climb a ledge that is like, no, no doubt. Like this, this fucking thing. Whoa, you can put your whole out. shoulder Whoa. on and pull Whoa. that. Time. No, stop. Stop. 
I re- respond to your rebuttal with one name, Ben Carson. Guy's a motherfucking okay. brain surgeon and doesn't understand pyramids. Batman can fix his back and not know how to climb, all right? Man's <laughs> able to not un- to understand one thing and not understand the other, all right? Like, all right, I'll give, I, no, give it a no, break. But Plus, it was still dude, bullshit. Dude, learn how it to fight bullshit. just using elbows. Like, was, he ain't right. See, here's, here's the thing. Batman climbs all the time with his little stupid batarang thing and climbing up poles right, and climbing up walls. and climbing. climbing? Up. It's the same. It's buildering. It's called buildering. When you boulder on buildings it's called building Bullshit. you can he's got you the gun and that fucking... shit hooks to his waist <laughs> and then he slides up like a rich guy on a fucking like standard stair lift where he just kind of rises up yeah. and then just holds those wings out when he gets up to the top we don't see the like 14 minutes in between of that slow winch just climbing Lord. him up the building yeah <laughs> that's what, again going back to the 60s batman that's what made adam west so great because you could see right. him yeah. actually Climbing fucking putting building. in the work. <laughs> See, 66 Batman would have had no problem with that fucking rope thing up there. It's bullshit. Well, you gotta give him credit for having a severed spine that he fixes with some rope and like really good massage. Mm. Mm. <laughs> like, he has a I've, severed spine. I've known, dude, I've like known, Miyagi's it. No, I've known injured climbers who have had worse injuries than that who, who are like blowing away. <laughs> so, so fuck that noise. Fuck that noise. I like also, how- also, Jamie Nolan was really was, was really accepting of like, oh, I mean, dude broke his back, and the second I shoot a hole through that, he's like, well, fuck his back. Like, let's talk about how he's a bitch now. But also, the my my biggest problem with Nolan Batman is his idea of master detective work is just, where's Virgil? Where's Virgil? Where's Virgil? I'm gonna punch you really hard and find stuff out. Where's Virgil? Like. He's, he's the dumbest detective I've ever seen on film, <laughs> oh, ever. He is every detective I've ever seen on film, ever. <laughs> like, he, he corners the guy in a room and shouts at him over and over again. Like, and Where's the trigger? Him, like, <laughs> <"Where's yeah." laughs> I always felt... You wouldn't give it to an ordinary citizen. <laughs> I always felt that Batman was supposed to be, like, uh, rich Sherlock Holmes with uh, parent issues. Like... No. And, he and, doesn't understand how the justice system works. He beats up people and leaves them hanging, which you cannot arrest people for just <laughs> hanging around. It's true. Like it's circumstantial at best. That's why everyone gets out. He needs he needs therapy. He's the world's shittiest detective because <laughs> he doesn't understand law. Like he, he's the greatest blues clues player I've ever true. seen. But <laughs> he's true. a shit detective. But I think I feel like on on the scale of detective work, I feel like the the Schumacher version and the um, Tim Burton versions were a little bit, they did, they pretended to do a little bit more detective work than the Nolan version. Cause Nolan version went to from like, Oh, here's a question I need to, to find out to punching a motherfucker in the face. Whereas <laughs> I, there were more steps in the, the older movies where they would have to come up with other stuff. And like 66 Batman was, was cheesy as fuck, but he was a detective. Like you believe that motherfucker could figure stuff out. <laughs> You believed that, I mean, Batusi man, he could figure shit out. Punchy, 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 punchy lisp man, he can't do, do shit without shouting. I don't trust him. What happens him. when you let a dude just wander around in his underoos? He's got to work <laughs> some shit out the hard way. The second you start giving everybody an iPhone, suddenly everybody's a goddamn scientist. <laughs> also, yeah. the, Riddler's, the Riddler's clues in Batman Forever were, were not the most difficult to figure out and i just love how they frame every time val kilmer like figures out one of the riddler's puzzles it's like this big you know epiphany <laughs> ooh, and it's like ooh, it's, a, ooh. it's a tennis ball dude come on <laughs> You're the world's greatest detective. how did you not figure out he's talking about tennis i don't know if nolan batman could have figured that shit out though <laughs> no he would have uh, reassembled the shattered bullet and given it to lucius fox to figure out that see you know, lucius fox, yeah, I was say. the man in the the man in the chair could have figured out lucius fox could have yeah. figured it out I mean, fuck it. Michael Caine would have figured that shit out. That's how Bruce would have handled that. Michael Caine could figure it out. Michael Caine. Yeah, Michael like Caine. he would have just handed it over to the guy on the Arizona iced tea container <laughs> and then just solved that shit. Michael By the way, Arnold Caine. Palmer and I found Michael a riddle Caine. the size <laughs> of a tangerine. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Which um, ironically is a tennis ball. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that is our dissertation on Batman. Yeah. <laughs> um, so every so if you week... want all that hot content without Jamie and I, go ahead and check <laughs> yeah, out the other go podcast. Yeah, go check out the, check out the, <laughs> the other podcast. 
uh, the local resident Batman stan, Keith Chow. Um, That's me. So uh, every week since uh, the protests have happened, I've been trying to look for stories of, of hope in, in this bleak trash fire that we call America that has been cut off from the rest of the world because our COVID cases are through the roof. Stay safe, everyone else. Don't let us in. <laughs> Just... <laughs> they say let the right one in. We are not the right one. Just yeah, yeah. Don't open Americans inside. Like yeah. just it's... yeah, yeah. <laughs> let Don't the Americans dead open inside. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, there's been a lot of talk about schools reopening um, in, in on the university side. Uh, the administration was going to put in this rule where um, uh, let's see. I, I, I swear to God, I did research on this. Um, but the, the idea was that if, you're, if your college or university was moving to online only and you were a foreign student, that, uh, that your visa was... They were going to kick you out. They were going to kick you out. So, if, so like, there are a bunch of students who were, were asking universities to have at least one class so that people... That, like one in-person class so that people could sign up and then show up so they wouldn't get kicked out of the country. And there was such backlash against this that a federal judge, U.S. District Judge uh, in where in Boston, um, uh, let's see, uh, forced the administration to rescind that rule. So they're not going to kick you out um, if you can't attend class in person. They're they're going to back to the other rules so that basically if ICE tracks you, they can kick you out. Um, but at least schools are are safe now. So students who um, who are, who are past their visa or who uh, are dreamers, they can still take courses online without fear of getting kicked out or ejected from the country. So, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Man, this whole school thing is... Well, on top of that, there was, you know, the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, who, by the way, has never attended public school, has no children who's ever attended public school, and is, in fact... Uh, her whole life's mission is to get rid of public school, but she's a secretary of education. Uh, she was out there last week talking about how, and the president was out there talking about how if school districts don't, K-12 school districts don't open up in the fall, that they're going to cut funding to those, which is, which is one crazy because, uh, that's not how school districts work. That, that's not how school districts. Yeah, there isn't federal funding for school districts. But two, if anything, school districts, if you make them open, need more funding because you got to think about like staggered schedules, more personnel to to because you can't have fifty kids in a room. Yeah. Um, so if anything, they need more funding. Uh, but the, the the irony of all of this, of course, is that like you know two months ago we were talking about defund the police, and you know the right wing was like grasping their pearls, clutching their pearls. And, yeah. and in the same breath, they're like, but we'll defund schools for sure. Like, <laughs> like the whole point of defund the police meant not necessarily Shift the money. <laughs> yeah. Not necessarily. Yeah. We don't need police. It means that police don't need 90% of the local budgets going to, you know, broken window policies. We, we can shift some of that to schools. And they're like, no. Yeah. Your million, school your million dollar tank could put air conditioning in Baltimore public schools. So fuck you. Right. Like, oh uh, no, man, I'm, I'm very worried uh, about <laughs> about how kids are going back to school. You you have a daughter, Keith. I have a daughter. Uh, you know, Montgomery County Public Schools said that they are going to be initially online uh, only when they reopen in the fall. Uh, that's going to be a nightmare because Hazel hated that shit. She's only kindergarten. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine what you know how Kane is doing with that. Yeah, no, it's it's tough. Like. You know, and just full disclosure, my day job is working in education as well, and this is something we're we're wrestling with too. And you know, the it's it's a you know choose your poison kind of thing because you can't have kids. You know, imagine try just try to imagine having your daughter with even nine other kids in a classroom wearing masks and staying six feet apart. It's not going to happen. No. As much as we want it to happen, it's not going to happen. Yeah. And then you have administrators and teachers and cafeteria ladies and bus drivers like. It's if we want coronavirus to go away, we can't just start ramming people into classrooms for eight hours a day for 180 days a week. At the yeah. same time, I mean, it, it's true that like online virtual distance learning isn't the ideal way to to learn. Um, so, 
it's, you know, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. And I think at this point, though, like our children's health is more important than what they're learning in school. Yeah. And, you know, if it makes no difference if they're accelerating their learning, if they're going to die in a couple of years because <laughs> they've, they've contracted some sort of disease yeah, or they, or, you know, they bring it home to you and your grandparents. So like, you know, like, uh, I'm all for keeping, you know, there's, there was something like hybrid where like they'll go for some of the day and then like some of the, some of it is going to be online. But like, even then the whole idea, again, imagine your daughter in first grade, keeping distant from other kids, keeping a mask on at all times. It's just not going to happen. It's, it's, an, yeah. it's an impossible thing. Yeah. I was going to say, I watched a, I watched a video this morning uh, of a New Jersey uh, school that uh, like an elementary school that is in a suburb of, uh, of New York. And they were basically talking about how there's like going to be maybe like 11 students in the class and every class has like, or every desk is separated six feet apart. And every desk has like its own like barricade dividers on everything. And the teacher's oh basically just supposed to stand in the corner and teach them somehow. <laughs> and then they're going to run a B schedules. And then they've taped lines down the hallway. So this way kids are only going like one way or the other oh, way. Wow. And all I can think is, how is this helping anyone? Like, I don't have kids, but at the same time, I can do the math of, you know, you can't expect children to keep a mask on all day. You no. can't expect them to not touch other people. You, you can't expect them. What happens if one of them needs to use a bathroom? Yeah. Like, what's the protocol? Are we sending staff in there to make sure that they thoroughly wash their hands for 20 seconds? Like, what's like, where, where are we at with this sort of thing? And like, and I understand the concept of, you know, kids don't learn as well in distance learning online classes. I totally understand that. And I can also understand the idea of children who require special needs. Maybe there needs to be a conversation about bringing back very limited staff so that parents who have students who require that sort of thing can then go back into an empty school so that they can get back on their routine and they can start developing or we can have a very limited schedule. We can keep them separated. We can then, you know, allocate the staff for that and spend a bit of extra money on those sort of things. I, I think there's a better way to really help the kids who absolutely need that structure. Mm -hmm. And kids who it's uncomfortable and it sucks like Hazel who has trouble learning from home with distance learning, but absolutely can by comparison to putting her life on the line and or her teachers or the staff or anyone else by having them go back and forth. Not to mention just the liability of those kids going out and then coming home and possibly being asymptomatic and infecting the parents. Like it's, it, yeah, it's, it feels foolish. It's and yeah, in both it's both directions, it's an equity issue because, like, if you if you're 100 percent virtual, you have to consider families who uh, either they have to work and they can't have kids at home all day long, or right. they don't have access to the technology to to engage in virtual learning. On yeah. the other hand, if you do open schools, it's another equity issue because families who can't afford to not work and keep their kids out of school are going to have to put their schools, kids in schools anyway. And that's and, right. And we know who's dying and, and getting sick the most out of yeah, COVID-19 and it's, it's black and brown right. kids. Yeah. So and, black and brown people, and it, and it will be black and brown kids who are going to uh, disproportionately be affected by COVID. Yeah. And, and so. I have 100% see what, what's going to happen immediately is one of the kids is going to be sick and the parents going to go, I can't miss work. And they're going to send an infected kid to school. And that's how it's going to start. Yeah. And it's something as simple as the lack of income and the tough position that the parent is put in, in the first place. And I really wish there was some sort of better way to manage this sort of thing. Like if, if it's a, if it's a funds versus whatever it is, and we need to just buy a bunch of iPads and give them out to these kids, fine, let's just do it. Cause I have to believe that the cost of those iPads is far less than the cost that everyone else in the school is going to feel when they send out a form letter that, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, who was your first grade gym teacher, is now deceased or little Jimmy or, you know, little yeah. so-and-so is now no <clears throat> longer with us. And we have to explain to these kids that, hey, so you know how you went to school? Uh-huh. So your, your little friend, your little friend passed and um, they passed and you're going to have to go back there. So good luck. Yeah. It's like... Why? Why are we doing this to children? I don't understand. 
Winning. And it's not just the devices, though, right? (laughs) It's not just devices. Like, I think we talk about defunding schools. Like, schools should give out, yes, devices to everyone, but they also should give out, like, Wi-Fi hotspots. Because that's the other other access issue, right? Like, you can have a device, but if you can't get on the internet or if your internet is super slow and everyone's doing these, like, Zoom classrooms, you need need broadband. You can't be on 56K. Yeah. Or whatever. (laughs) Right. You know? Okay. Fucking (laughs) dial-up. Well, hang on. I have to believe that you could have Verizon, AT&T, whatever it is, get a huge tax write-off to hand public school systems hotspots for these things and write the whole thing off on the back end. You're trying to tell me that none of these companies would be willing to go out of pocket for the ridiculous kickback they would get at the end of the year? Yeah. Like, I have to believe that between all of them, there's money there to do that, and there's incentive there of them sitting down with the CEO of at and and going, hey, so if you issue, I don't know, um, 50000 here and 100000 there, whatever it is to these kids, and they apply for it, and they have to, you know, like there's a program where you say, have you, hey, you have to apply for this, you have to do the thing, but we get it. I have to believe between the large carriers that we can cover this. Like we're already oh, giving I mean, these companies that's the thing about kickbacks. corporate like, America. It, we right? can do it. Yeah, yeah. You were talking about Bruce Wayne. Like that's the problem, though, right? Like, right. But I have no problem incentivizing the them. <laughs> I have no yeah. problem incentivizing. Like at this point, I'm yeah. willing to scratch their back to solve the short term problem, uh, before it becomes a long term problem. Fuck it. Like if you want to tell me, hey, so AT and T isn't paying taxes this year at all. But they gave all of these kids hotspots this way. No unnecessary kids had to die. Fuck yeah. it. I'm good with that. I like, think that's worth it. My, my taxes ain't going to change. I'm good with that. I'm fine with it. I don't care. Like, I, good. I think it's a simple solution to a problem. And but that's what I'm saying. Is like corporations don't like don't think that way for some reason, right? Like right. even if they get this big kickback at the end, like there's never a, you right, know, but if only we elected... The good of the- yeah. <laughs> if only we elected many. hundreds of people to represent us in a large governing body to present problems. Like, can we not at least have Neil deGrasse Tyson fucking hot tweet these guys at, <laughs> at the minimum? <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know if he has kids anymore, so I don't think it's uh, on the fourth round of his of his mind. Did, that did they die from coronavirus? Because I feel like he should still give a shit. Yeah, yeah. Like, if, if he's going to hot tweet about the movie, uh, what is it, Gravity or whatever it is, I feel like he can at least spend four minutes laying down <laughs> some educational law about children not dying. Like, I think it's the, the least yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson can do. Yeah, like, unfortunately, I don't think Neil deGrasse Tyson's, like, political science is his, uh, is his forte. <laughs> I don't know how many times he ever tweets about, like, Fuck it, like who's, yeah. who's going to correct him? <laughs> right? Like, fuck it. We're asking Chuck Woolery what to do. Like, oh, we can't. <laughs> God, motherfucker. I just, it's, it's, it's dismaying to see that, like, the, the party of family values doesn't give a shit about kids. And, like, all of this stuff, or, like, all of these people with all these family values are the ones yelling the loudest to get your kids back into school. And it's like, they're going to die, and they're going to kill the teachers. What is your? Point? You know, I read somewhere like, but we knew this back in 2012 when a guy walked into a Connecticut elementary school and mowed down children, first graders, with yeah. an assault rifle, and people were like, "Yeah, that's that's the cost of freedom." So, yeah. like this idea of like sending kids to their impending doom at school. I guess is, yeah, I guess we're okay with that. <laughs> Come yeah, on, it's here. part of the- <laughs> fuck your kids, just <laughs> fuck them, fuck you, fuck your kids. We don't care about you. Oh, you're not independently wealthy yet? Well, fuck. What's wrong with you? Yeah. That's, uh, that's what I've Wait, I learned thought this about was America. Supposed to, like, <laughs> I thought this was supposed to be like we find little bits of hope. Well, the little bit of yes, hope James, is that you're not going to get deported man? by taking online classes. And that's <laughs> Thank it. goodness. That's Jesus. It. That's it. That's the only good. Yeah. See, every, every happy story I come with, it has to be cherry-picked because if you go too far outside that bubble, everything starts to fall apart. So Yeah. Can- Congratulations, dreamers. You get to stay here. You can stay here. <laughs> but if you're a kid, you're going to die. So what do you want? What do you want? We can only do one good thing every week. Fuck. Oh, God. I missed when things used to be simple. Like kids used to just get rickets. Yeah. Uh, I have a not, not silly story, but a, a more lighthearted story. Uh, <laughs> Let's are, hope so. Are either of you uh, fans of the Scooby-Doo's? 
Do you like the Scooby Doo? Sure. I I uh, have Yeah, I'm I'm a casual fan. I do not personally give a shit one way or the other. Um, but apparently, uh, James Gunn was one of the writers for the original 2001 film, the live action film. And in his, okay. in, in his original script, Velma was supposed to be super duper gay. And like she was supposed to make out with, uh, is it Daphne? Daphne? Daphne. Sir, yeah. yeah. Like they, they had scripted a, a scene where they, they kiss and make out and stuff. And Sarah Michelle Geller even said that um, the actress who played Velma, Linda Car- Cardellini, is a really good kisser. So they had this all planned out, but of course, 2001, the studio was not woke, and so they were like, no, 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 put the kibosh on that. Um, apparently, uh, there was a 2010 cartoon, 2010 to 2013, uh, yeah. Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated, and yes. the producers and writers can, can, canonically fully intended to make Velma gay in that. Uh, they yeah, just, it, it feels pretty obvious when you watch it. <laughs> yeah, they and and they even back in the seventies. Yeah, they they try. <laughs> well, they, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. But like they they really like get right up to the fucking cliff with that one. Like you in that cartoon if you in the twenty. Bother to pay cartoon? attention, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, the one of the producers came out and is he's like, oh no, we we would have we would have gone there if we were allowed to, but for whatever reason we weren't allowed to. And then after the series, Velma is dating. Um, Marcy, um, so like that's 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 their headcanon. So uh, Velma has been canonically gay for a while now, and um, I don't know, they just haven't been able to show it on screen for whatever reason. <laughs> <laughs> Although to be fair, I don't quite trust the uh, was it the two thousand one. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it's a, it's a true story, but I don't know that it Because you don't trust James Gunn? Right. I don't know that it was written as we're going to what? be progressive and have hey, like why representation. Why wouldn't you trust James Gunn, huh? I think it was that, more def- it was definitely like, here's a titillating yeah. scene between Sarah Michelle Geller, Geller yeah. and Linda Cardellini. Yeah. 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 Um, but uh, hopefully we'll get an interpretation where they can, uh, where Velma can actually express herself as as out and about and proud. Because uh, apparently they, uh, in the 2010 cartoon, when she was dating Shaggy, they wanted to make that as awkward as possible because it, it wasn't something that she wanted and just like it, it wasn't going to ever work out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah it, it, I, re- I remember watching this. Um, I, I, I used to um, sometimes uh, after work, I used to help watch my friend's kids and they would love watching that show. And oh, cool. I immediately noticed it and I was like, <laughs> all right cool and like i like we would sit eating dinner and i would wait for them to just broach it and watch one of the two of them be like hey so and i'd be like sit down let's have a conversation and it never happened i was like why the fuck didn't you guys just pull the trigger on that yeah like, yeah I, I don't know i i guess they really didn't i feel like scooby-doo is a weird one that would catch a lot of heat if they were really upfront about it mm. I guess, uh, I guess Cora. Because I have to, to t- believe there's a lot of, well, because you got to figure like there's going to be a lot of older people who used to watch the old '70s version who yeah. was like, "This is my favorite thing ever, and I love <laughs> Scooby Doo, and I've been collecting Scooby Doo things, and I've got like 45 different Mystery Machine cookie jars, and then and this is what do you mean she's a lesbian?" And you're like, <laughs> "Whoa, no, Janice, stit, no, <laughs> like you have to calm yourself." Yeah. yeah. So I guess I, I could I, see that happening. So I understand on on the one hand why they the studio didn't feel as though they were ready because yeah. they would have caught a ton of heat. Good, because <laughs> fucking normalize this shit. But yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I can totally see the conversation happening in real time. I feel like uh, Steven Universe had to fly so that Cora could inch forward so that Shira could just <laughs> jump on it. You know, <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, so hopefully there will be better re- representation in, in that aspect. Um, so we, we like to treat our guests as if they've been on our show forever. So Keith Chow, what have you been geeking on? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny. I actually, uh, I was thinking about this question before I came on cause I knew this was coming. <laughs> and I don't know what I've been geeking on. Although I, I, I have to admit the one thing, the one thing I've been doing a lot the last uh, several weeks actually I, I found i fell down this youtube rabbit hole of millennials discovering pearl jam 
<laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> that like, fucking guy, the hip hop guy. Yes, that's literally one of having them. to stop watching. Um, what the fuck was, he was it? Was unplugged it? version of Black. Black. So, that's what. Full it is. disclosure. Yeah, yeah. Full disclosure. Oh I, I, I am not ashamed to admit that I am a huge Pearl Jam fan. I was. I I watched. Why would MTV Why would you unplugged. be ashamed of liking Pearl? Oh, Jam. I don't know. I. I I, I, I have a complex well, about clearly it, you have not seen our demographic have we been have <laughs> we been shitting on is that no we love pearl jam like i'm Please trying understand. to think our, our fan venn diagram are two circles on top of each other like <laughs> know this yeah <laughs> well yeah, i thought always thought of pearl jam was the was the corporate sellout right like that was what? The group that make you your money motherfucker out. dude <laughs> You know, which is which, right? I always thought was 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 ironic because they were the ones who were like, "We're not going to make money because they, we're going to fight Ticketmaster," and yet they were, that, that, they were the uncool. They released and, the album first. Ten came out before fucking Nirvana. Yes, that's right. I have feelings. And, no, I'm glad. <laughs> oh, I, I should be on this podcast more often then because I, I don't have to. I don't have to wallow in my Pearl Jam. You don't have to defend no. loving Pearl Jam. Come on now. No. <laughs> and then they become like dad rock, apparently. Like, which is what, again, which is what's great about seeing like 20 year olds watching the unplugged uh, concert and, and like being blown away by Eddie Vedder's voice. Oh yeah. And, and so like, I just, I saw the one, I think the hip hop head one, where yeah, this yeah, guy yeah. just like, Oh my God. <clears throat> and then, and then just, you know how the algorithm starts recommending more and more and more videos. So I've, I've literally watched like 30 different videos of like 20 somethings watching and not just watching Pearl Jam but watching the unplugged version of Black. Nice. And it's the best thing in the world. I love it. I <laughs> love watching and I, and it's it's the like I love that song so much. It's probably my favorite song. Not just for Pearl Jam song. I think Black is my favorite song. Right. On, and so right. and I know that performance like by heart. Yeah. So I'm not even watching the little screen of Eddie. I'm yeah. just watching the guy going like <laughs> Uh, what jamie he has such a meltdown that he stops tape after vetter delivers lines and then repeats them back as if we didn't hear what vetter just said <laughs> to explain it to us like you have to know <laughs> right. and, then, and, then, and then he stops again because he's like i don't think you understand and then gives us a brief behind the scenes about his fiance and how she's the most important thing and like he's like i i need to call my fiance i i can't handle this right now and, like, and all i'm looking at that right is, away when the, when we're done here i'm looking that shit up this goober looking fuck looks like somebody who i wouldn't want to hang out with in high school who oh, goes sure. under somehow uh, like the moniker hip hop head and i swear he's got like what 13 million youtube followers or some bullshit and We're like doing this wrong man you. make make your money <laughs> yeah. like don't get me wrong good on you make your money but the idea <clears throat> of a guy who looks like that one discovering pearl jam blew my fucking mind right out of the gate and then suddenly him liking is like well yeah dick that's in your dna <laughs> do you understand what you look like <laughs> Like you're half a flannel and acoustic guitar away from somebody telling you to shut the fuck up. Like, <laughs> by the way, you should label this episode like "Hip Hop Heads React to Pearl Jam" if you <laughs> want to get those thirteen million hits. Because the algorithm, I will fuck with that that's algorithm. what we're doing from here on yeah. in. Is yeah. we are finding really popular YouTube videos and just renaming them this. <laughs> <laughs> no, and then the best part is like, so again, I, like I think he was the first one I saw. And then it just led me to all these other people. And the, the best ones are with like, people are like explaining the song to you, you know? So it's like, they'll pause the song like, man, that girl <laughs> fucked Eddie up, man. <laughs> like, yeah, she did. Yeah. Thank God she did. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, just, it's, it's, it's great. And I just love seeing people who had like, you know, I mean, that MTV performance was literally 27 years ago, 28 years ago. Jesus. Jesus yeah. Don't say that motherfucker. And, and, uh, and and seeing like peak Eddie, you know, yeah, I, on a stool singing his heart out, and then Jesus. and then like, like, kids I, younger <clears throat> than that performance discovering it. There's something something uh, wholesome and beautiful about that. I I really wish that somebody would sit down these these guys and like sit down with like the Clapton unplugged where he plays Tears in Heaven, and mm -hmm. then somebody stops them like halfway <clears throat> through the song and then explains that this song uh, is about his son who fell off of a balcony. 
and watch him be like, wait, what? And you're like, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Latin's kid pass, and then he wrote this tribute. By the way, let's double back to Layla. And I then know. <laughs> fine, <laughs> I was about talk to about say. how him and the guy from the Beatles had a fucking guitar battle for her love, <laughs> and then he won. <laughs> So that's what I'm geeking on. I'm Good. Geeking. Yeah. <laughs> Good wholesome <laughs> shit. He is. Wholesome shit. Uh, Brandon <sighs> Chalmers, what have you been geeking on since last we we, we so, chatted? <laughs> much like our, our mm. esteemed boss, I have been falling down a YouTube rabbit hole um, <laughs> in a different direction. Um, mm. One that um, most recently today ended up being very, very somber um, because I've been watching a lot of Adam Savage videos. Oh, um, fuck. He's been, yeah, because he's been doing a lot of one-day builds in his shop. And the idea of Savage, who I absolutely adore, just basically setting up a shotgun mic and his, and his cell phone on, on a little rig and just building shit and then explaining things to you. He's putting out these semi-raw looking, you know, 24 to, to hour and a half long videos of just him making shit is great background noise while you're doing your own stuff. Um, sure. So if you get the opportunity, boy, howdy, will it send you down a rabbit? Jamie, I actually started pricing out hand tools Ooh. to carve bowls. Like, I, I was... I, it, it got my my like my white guy juices flowing where I was yeah, like yeah. I need to start woodworking and it's yeah. like no you don't you don't need to do that yeah, you don't need no, the square yeah. footage for it yeah I don't ha I have, have to get back to work you have Jamie a backyard you have a backyard have, you can I make a mochi get... stump a mochi stump you can help me make <laughs> no. my mochi stump <laughs> yeah you mean that thing that we tried to do what? was that almost a decade ago we we did that uh, I don't know man it was yeah. it was like God. four or five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to give you okay, little little bit of context. Jamie messages me out of the blue, right? And goes, Hey man, you should check out how they make mochi. And I was like, What? And then he sends me this YouTube link of these dudes basically with, with like a hollowed out stump hop, hop, and then the hop, hammer, hop, right? Hop. And the fold and then the hammer and the fold and the hammer and the fold and the hammer. And he was like, Bruh, I want to make mochi. And I was like, I'm here for it. Let's <laughs> fucking go. Let's let's do this thing. Jamie, you need to enroll your daughter in a Japanese school, which is down the street from where you live. Because I, I mean, back when we had like you know public places, but my daughter goes to this Japanese school in Bethesda, and every New Year's they they bring out the mochi hammer and do mochi tsuki for New Year's. Different idea. Have your daughter invite us over uh, for New Year's, <laughs> and we'll hang out at the school. <laughs> and we'll be her family for that day and eat the mochi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here for all of that. So Jamie talks me into this. So I drive down, right? We then do a combo day of a photo shoot for t-shirts he was promoting at the time. And then he manages to talk me into hauling out what I can only describe as the 150 pound tree stump <laughs> on my shoulder, carrying it up a hill and then loading it into the back of his car <laughs> to put into his driveway so that Jamie can carve this thing out. Did it rot in the carport? Is that what happened? It's still there. I haven't had a it's chance to get back there. to it. I, I haven't had a chance to get back to it because like shortly after that, all this other stuff happened. So like I've, I've been super busy. <laughs> <laughs> I like for five how, years. For yeah, five fucking I, I like, years. I like how Jamie's description is like, right, yeah. So I, I talked you into this and then you loaded it in there and then like SpongeBob uh, time many years later. <laughs> and you're like, all right, here we are. <laughs> right, here we are. I did, I did try to, to, to cut a bowl shape, but I don't have the right tools. There is an electrical bore thing that is shaped to like hollow out nah. hollow out bowls. I have an see, ads. The ads doesn't. Oh, quite. see, that's the thing that I want. Yeah, I have yeah. one. Oh, yeah, and you probably spent way too much on it. <laughs> no, it was like thirty bucks. Oh, okay, cool. Got, so you had the same problem I did, yeah. which is so I started pricing all this stuff out, and I was like, "This is going to be a really expensive, simple hobby because either you I went buy cheapo, I went really nice stuff. Well, here's the problem though: is if you buy cheap crap, you have to know how to properly sharpen it. Mm. And I don't know if you have the tools to properly sharpen it, but I know I don't. Mm. Yeah. So in turn, I <laughs> talked myself into and then out of <laughs> this concept. <laughs> No, Brandon, you need an ad. You need to start your Etsy shop where you have handmade no, handmade no, bowls no, from a mountain no, man no, from Balmer. No, stop. That stop. there there is a market, motherfucker. Mar no. There's a market for that. 
You stain you, that shit. You put that listen on Listen to me, and you're not the only one who needs to hear this. Hear this, <laughs> all creators. Stop. You do not have to turn your hobby into a business. You can just enjoy your thing and let that be it. Nope. Like, nope, if nope, you want to nope, give nope, away his Christmas gifts, cool. You want to go ahead and randomly show up at some middle school when things are better for a Christmas bazaar and make 300 bucks? Good on you. Yes, that's, that's what you do. stop trying to suddenly turn this into an <laughs> Etsy hustle where you're like, <laughs> I got to get this thing going. And no, no. You're enjoy the thing that that desire that you had to be like you know what i really like to make that i think that'd be a lot of fun the second it turns into a job you hate all of it and then you start <laughs> looking for other things don't do it to yourself don't <laughs> See, i don't I, for for me personally i don't find that true for drawing because like i like drawing so much that i don't care I, that i have to do it for a job please understand I'm talking about people who have regular day jobs. Ah. Uh, much like <laughs> you, that? if you suddenly decided that, hey, so I know I do, you know, art and graphic design and this and this and this and this, but what I'd really like to do, like my passion is making wooden shoes. Mm. And I'm going to really double down on this wooden shoe thing. <laughs> like really double down on it. And then suddenly your desire to make wooden shoes in the like 14 minutes a day you have free between <laughs> doing all of the things you do. Yeah. Suddenly you're like, well, I got to throw them up online and sell them. I can't just enjoy the thing I create. Well, that's, that's <laughs> why you make two. You make two. You make the first one for you because that's the fucked up one. Then you make the second one. You say, does anyone want to buy this? And if someone says yes, then you turn that hobby into a hustle. If anyone says, oh, that's really cute <laughs> and they don't buy it, then you just make these as gifts for your friends. That's how it works. That's yeah, how okay. Works. Here's, here's the other thing I'm going to break down for you all. And this is going to be a tough reality. Nobody wants your second of anything, okay? <laughs> you did not make anything worth selling on your second try. You didn't. <laughs> You, you got to go through literally making, making like a log cabin out of wooden shoes before you get to selling them shoes. Mm -hmm. Like you need a year of clogging, just, just <laughs> clogging your way through before you get there. Yeah. Uh, Br Brandon, uh, when, 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 when the virus is over, uh -huh, we're hanging out, we're hanging out again. I need yep. a bowl for to hold the <laughs> chips while we watch stupid shit on television. Cool. I'll go to Ikea. No. I need a, I need a Brandon Chalmers. He needs a wooden bowl. shoe. I need a Brandon Chalmers in. original wooden Bruh, bowl. If, if you like, uh, no, I can make it original. I'll go to Ikea and I'll bring out the puffy paint. Like, you're going to get a sweet ass unicorn on the side of this bowl. Like, make yes. no mistake. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, really, that's what my side Etsy <clears throat> hustle is going to be, is buying things that you can buy and then doing children's uh, like arts and crafts projects on the side of them. I swear to God, I bet there's a market for that. <laughs> oh, I'm sure there is. <laughs> I don't want to find out. I don't want to talk to anybody who'd buy that. <laughs> Like, Man. dude, that, that's, that's the, that's, it reminds me of the rabbit hole of Green Lantern fans. Mm. Are the Green Lantern fans? Yeah. Do you yeah. want to talk to any of them? No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> it depends. Depends. Which, it depends which Green, Green Lantern they're a fan of. No, it doesn't. <clears throat> Cause the, the fact guy... that you have to make this caveat <laughs> is exactly my point. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of reminds me of like action figure collectors who like breed paint or like cast their own like accessories for the for the for the figures and it's like yes why are you doing the work for hasbro dude <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right like, like you put in a lot of labor after spending 30 dollars on an action figure right yeah break, break into that real market and start modifying like 40k models or whatever it is like there are <laughs> sad dudes who are sitting at home who, who will pay you for that work like you don't have to modify that spider-man figure you are right <laughs> But I want Japanese Spider-Man, and they don't sell the version that I want. I think they actually do. They're coming that. out with one. Yeah, I think they actually uh, are. Yeah. It's, a, it's an eighty-dollar figure, but you know it's yeah. coming out. Uh, don't 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 waste your money. Don't waste your money on SH Figure Arts. They look amazing, but you can only pose them once. Because if you pose them a second time, the joints just turn into rubber, and they just hang on your shelf like this. It's not worth it. <laughs> it's not worth it. It's not worth it. They look pretty as fuck. 
It's not worth it. Don't, don't do it, Keith. How many SH I already fig- have. I, have, I, I was I about have, to ask you, how many SH already. figure art Batman do you have? <laughs> yeah, no, I have several DC uh, figure arts. Here. I like them more than Mafex, though. Mafex, I find, are fragile shit. Like, you can't, you turn the arm one way and it falls <laughs> off in order to be put back on. But no, I, yeah, I, I do have do a few don't do it. Don't figure do it. arts. You should, you I should. like the figure arts. You should sell them shits because it's not <laughs> You could put them you shits on, on eBay. Facebook. You know what I have. <laughs> <laughs> True. Terrible. Put all my shit on Facebook. You shouldn't do that shit. Yeah, save it's too money. late. You I'm should already, save. Already you should save up, and you should get the hot toys because them shits last. Because they're Hang like machined out of fucking aluminum and stuff. I love how <clears throat> Jamie, with his ridiculous amount of toys, guitars, and other things, and camera <laughs> talk, is like, "Bruh, save your money." You're like, "Who right. the fuck are you?" These, these are my common rider figures. There's like three dollars a piece. <laughs> they're made out of like <laughs> soft vinyl. They they're like you know, you chuck them, you don't care, you play with them. If you put that but on my shelf, favorite thing, though, is he's like, don't spend seventy dollars on an action figure. Spend two hundred and fifty dollars on an action figure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you if you add up all the SH figure arts of Batman's, you could have gotten one big ass, awesome <laughs> hot toy Batman with like machined aluminum and metal and batarangs that could like cut you and cut you in half and shit. So I actually do have I have one hot toy. I have the Michael Keaton Batman hot toy. Oh. Never taken him out of the box. My oh. uncle gave it to me several years ago in Hong Kong. So like, it's like directly from the Hot Toys uh, showroom. But wow. I've never taken it out of the box. Um, yeah. So I don't actually know what they feel like in hand because I'm just too scared to touch them. That's my problem with Hot Toys. Like, at least with figure arts. Like, are, are you, you going to sell this thing? The, thing, <laughs> the, the Hot Toy Batman? <clears throat> yeah. No, because I did. So I, I'm a big fan of the Birds of Prey movie that was released earlier this okay. year. Okay, so great. Right and I'm a lot of fun. such a big fan of that movie that when... Uh, Sideshow released the pre-order for the Harley Quinn with the caution tape jacket and the burrito and, and the uh, um, the glitter egg, gun egg and cheese sandwich. Oh no, it just comes with an egg and cheese sandwich. Oh shit! Right, I I pre-ordered it and I and and it, they got me because not only did I pre-order the Harley Quinn, I also got the Mandalorian with child. Oh hot toy. fuck! Oh so yeah, I I fell I fell hard down the hot toys. Uh, <sighs> once, right. once you go hot toys you never go back because nothing is gonna live up to that like see yeah. even the black series paint on the on those faces which is better than anyone else is doing it's it's still not hot toys <laughs> you're gonna be like yeah we'll see, see this we'll is see this is my issue this is like collecting cars and then leaving them sit in the garage like, <laughs> <laughs> fucking touch that thing man that's, like, why, that's why I like the three dollar self vinyl common writers because you pick yeah, them up, like, you throw them at Hazel, Hazel throws them back at you. <laughs> you can still play with them. Just go, like, go hard and do a video of it. Piss some people off. <laughs> Take them out of the package and rip that box open like it's fucking <laughs> Christmas morning. Just be like, fuck it, it's just mine. Hmm. Who's getting it? Nobody. Fucking burying this shit with me. I'm going out like fucking Pharaoh. Fucking put it in the casket. <laughs> me and Michael Keaton, we going downtown. Like, that's what's going on. Those Iron Man hot toy figures with all that machined aluminum, you could just run around and smack kids with it. Just yeah, yeah. Wham, wham. Have you ever <laughs> seen the uh, Hot Toys ad? It's a YouTube ad, like, you know, because they don't show Hot Toys ads on TV. But, yeah. like, it's, um, it's like this, you know, 40, 40 year old white dude in a, in a bathrobe, like, having coffee. And he's got these empty shelves and he looks out the window and his kids got all his Hot Toys in the sandbox and, like, banging them together. And it's like he, he, this, this wash of horror, this look of horror washes <laughs> over his face. It's a good ad. No, I, I, my, my daughter tells me all the time, I've, I've, turned into the bad guy from toy story 2 like all of my toys sit <laughs> yeah. inside the glass shelf i've, oh. I've become um what's oh, the dude's name shit wayne knight uh, ow. <laughs> oh man ow. Oh. all my toys oh. sit. but you know i'll take them out pose them and put them back behind the glass shelf i don't i'm not a I'm, i don't keep them in boxes necessarily i'll take yeah, them out for the that box. one yeah. Well, well the, just because like I'm too. The thing, that's the thing. Like a three hundred dollar toy. What, what are you? What are you afraid of? That you're gonna <laughs> love it more? You're gonna be like. No, I just. <laughs> it's like, the same reason. Like I like lost you're, after you're Jordan, but would never buy gonna, one. 
Yeah. Like, like, yeah, like he's going to open the box and suddenly he's going to touch it and it's just going to turn to ash. You'd be like, <laughs> I knew it. I knew <laughs> it's, it. It's, you don't look at the arc when you open it. I know what happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't look backwards or you get dragged to hell. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Well, so that's the thing. Like, what am I going to do when these two new ones come in and... And the, the, the other thing too is like because they're gonna look bobo compared to that shit. yeah well that's the thing like that's that's the that's the extent of my like high-end collecting right like most of my collection are like 20 dollars marvel legends and star wars black series figures and then the gi joe classified series. I, i'm I'm thank you for letting me hijack your podcast and turn it into a <laughs> Keith is really geeking out about a lot of stuff that he didn't think he was geeking out <laughs> yeah. about. turns out he really didn't need a podcast yeah. it's yeah. just like <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, Brandon's talking about woodworking and it comes back to Keith talking about Batman yeah. toys. It's all good. It's all good. Jamie, I you notice I'm not rebutting like it's as long as the boss is happy. That's all I care about. Like that's what we're here for. So Brandon, can you make me some action figures? I think is No. No. You, you don't need some Hang on, wait, wait. No, I can IKEA solve this. Hang on. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> IKEA solve. Wait, wait. Hang on. I got this. Walk <laughs> dude. Yeah. See? Paint, paint, paint a Batman logo on that one. Isn't Fucking, it? yeah, watch it. Hey, watch it. Did, 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 did. What, did, you, did you buy that originally so that you can use it for drawing references? Uh, yeah. Oh. Yep. Do you still, do you still draw stuff and stuff? Uh, no. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Damn it. And let me go ahead and put a little thing on that. Little thing so for, for those of you who are on the audio version of the podcast, this is scintillating, scintillating content. Brand, Brandon is now currently modifying a wooden doll that he purchased from Ikea. The traditional wooden dummy that you see on artist tables that like is terrible because it's out of proportion and it doesn't move in the direction that you want to. And it's supposed to be gender neutral, but it's totally a man because... <laughs> Because the patriarchy, but also it is terribly done. Yep, I got it. Okay, so I don't know if you can see that, but <laughs> I, I wrote Batman on nice. it. Batman. And then I wrote, I wrote Justice on his crotch, so this way nice. you know where he's at. Yeah. Perfect. Got you. By the way, uh, just a little bit of a hard flex. You never actually see that, Jamie. I never actually use it for drawing because actually what it does is it holds my Burger King uh, Alf toy from like 1994. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so yes. it is the perfect stand for my <laughs> Alf is really what that is. It's Yeah, it's a better use because that dummy is not very good for drawing. No, 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 no. no. That's, that's, no. A bad, but, that's a bad dummy. But he makes an excellent Alf stand. So <laughs> Yeah. So are you going to get into woodworking or did you decide not to? I, I think I'm going to hold off right now. Um, I ended up getting... A, I ended up getting a, a like free gift card from a dumb old thing from my previous job and ended up buying a bunch of things for the dog instead. So Aww. decided to go practical instead. But, you know, I, I figure uh, use it as an excuse to follow my previous passion, which was getting the fuck out of the house and like running off into the woods and, and trying to make myself thinner. And sure, why not? Um, <laughs> <laughs> fucking failing <laughs> as as. By the way, kids, quick aside, one of my favorite things about meeting Keith, it, within 20 minutes of meeting him, dude straight up called me depressed Thor, which I absolutely adore Did him I? calling me out that fucking hard. Did I? I don't remember. Yes. That. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. It was delightful. Like, you hit me, and I was going to rebut. I was like, no, dude fucking owned me. I, I got to just <laughs> wear that shit. <laughs> sad thor sad like, thor. like he lifts a lot of things but fuck does he enjoy burritos like that is me that is... <laughs> and he still has stormbreaker so fuck that shit <laughs> shit yeah, sad yeah thor if i if i can use stormbreaker and eat cheese steaks shit yeah <laughs> that's the only From shape the you MCU. need that's that's the only shape you need you're happy yeah. and you smash shit <laughs> I also love that I predicted sad Thor apparently five years ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> when the fuck did you and I meet five years ago? This was like, I don't know, what was this? Wait, like, wait, did we years? meet? I uh, we, did, Rockville I Festival, met... like maybe three years ago? Uh, oh, the Bubble Tea Festival. I just would have been yeah. right after the movie came we out. Met, I think we might have met earlier than that because I felt we, like we, we met probably at a, did. At a like, Warrock gig. Yeah, yeah, but I don't think you like don't you remember. and I got a chance to really hang out or anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> 
Was it? Yeah, no. It was still. It was still before uh, Endgame, though, right? I still predicted that door. Right there. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna give you that one. I. I <laughs> was, I'm gonna totally give you that Avengers one. Endgame. That's, <laughs> yeah. The yeah, Russo stole you, it from me. You totally nailed it. You got it first. You pegged me, and you were like, "That guy kind of looks like Thor." No, I don't. And then, <laughs> boy, how does he look like? He needs a friend. <laughs> Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. oh no, I made it uncomfortable. Boss, I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> so, Jamie, the fuck are we talking about? Because uh, it looks like uh, Keith is in the middle of some sort of woodworking shop. <laughs> oh, well, uh, I could either talk about what I was geeking on or we could go right to the topic. We could go right to the topic. What are you geeking on? What are you geeking on, Ben? Uh, so this past weekend was pretty good for Common Rider. Uh, Common Rider, uh, one of the streaming services, um, Mill House or whatever, one of the, one of the places that localizes stuff and sends out videos and shit like that. They got the rights to stream one of the Common Rider movies for uh, North America for the first time in for fucking ever. So on YouTube on Saturday, I think it was at like eight. Uh, 8 Eastern Time, 5 o'clock Western Time. Uh, Heisei Generations Forever Common Writer whatever was premiered uh, on YouTube for a Western audience with subtitles. Uh-huh. And for the first time in a long time in America, Common Writer was trending for like, um, like a good <laughs> hour or so. Um, so it was cool. I have issues. Uh, it is if... What? If the, Wait, hang on. I Wait, can't just watch no, stuff, Brandon. I can't just watch stuff, Brandon. Time set. We're, we're what? Are, are, are we just about an hour into the podcast? <laughs> it's going to be long. We're about an hour in, We have right? a guest. It's going to be long. Fuck it. That's um, fine. No, just, just saying. Like, it took you an hour to have issues. That is a goddamn record. So, uh, if the intent was to introduce new people to Common Rider, this was the exact wrong movie to show people because it requires background knowledge of the two previous preceding series. So you needed two years of continuity to understand what was going on in this movie, let alone recognize all of the writers that showed up. So before the movie premiered, they held an online panel where they were, they were going to talk about Kamen Rider for an hour. And at no point during this panel did they explain what people were about to fucking see. So it, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's as if I invited you over to my house and made you watch Common Rider without telling you what the fuck <laughs> I was talking about. We I made did that. I, we recorded an episode. And, yeah, <laughs> I at least warned you, I at least warned you what you were about to watch and gave you maybe two minutes of background. So you understood that this was like the original character and all that stuff like that. I, I think you really, really may be overestimating how strong the plot needs to be for Common Rider. <laughs> like, I, I'm not I, trying to shit on something that you no, genuinely enjoy. But I, like, I, I don't disagree with you, but the, the movie I showed you didn't require any foreknowledge of the series that preceded it because it was all no, about... It, it probably should have because that weird old guy, I spent a lot of time being like, what's up with Asian Hulk? Like, I don't understand what's going on. <laughs> but it was, it was a self-contained movie. It didn't, okay. it didn't develop, it didn't delve into the lore of the previous series. Like if, if it was divorced from the regular show, you wouldn't have known. Cause like, you know, ghost shows up here is powers. Who cares? This is really all about Ichigo Japanese Hulk. It's all about him and it's his story. That's, that's what the movie is surrounded on. So like if, if you haven't watched Kamen Rider before you have this new character that you've never seen. If you have watched Common Rider before, here's an old guy that you've seen before, and it's like, hooray! It's 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 got. Okay. I will admit that it was not an understandable movie that I showed you, but it made more sense <laughs> than this movie because this movie is very plot heavy and it has timey wimey Doctor Who bullshit in it that makes no sense if you've never seen any Common Rider before. And there's a huge big deal cam- cameo towards the end of it which also makes no sense. So like, I don't know. I feel like this was not a good introduction to Common Rider for a new person. For an old time fan who's been watching it for years, this is a big fucking deal. I was super excited. I watched the whole thing. I was jumping up and down on the couch. Audrey was side-eyeing me like, what the fuck is wrong with you? These, 
crazy people dressing up in bug suits. What's wrong with you? I fucking love it. But for people who are not fans, they're not watching know. that. I don't, they're I don't not yeah, watching. Maybe that. it's not for like, them. I, yeah, maybe it's I, for you. I don't, it's just you, I, Jamie. Yeah, dude, yeah, it's like, just me. <laughs> that's that's not for the cash. Like nobody, yeah. nobody suddenly decides to get up and be like, you know what today is? Today's the Common day Rider. I get into Common Rider. <laughs> yeah, like no, like you don't <laughs> because today of this that YouTube day. video. Today is that day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank goodness I couldn't find it anywhere else. But now, <laughs> thanks to the power of YouTube, I can finally enjoy this weird fuck show. Yeah. I don't understand any of this. This is terrible. <laughs> like, and I don't know. I feel like there, there might have been a shorter movie or a dumber movie that they could have chosen that would have a chance to get new people into it. But I don't know. It, it was for me, which I appreciate. But I'm not the person that they need to get. Like I'm, I'm in. I'm already. No, in. no, 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 no. Whoa! Time out. Understand. How many toys have you bought at Common Rider? A lot. You're exactly the motherfucking guy. You don't need guys <laughs> like me who are cash as fuck who could be like, no, nah, this is kind of fun, and I could totally understand having this on his background noise. They need some hardcore toy buying motherfuckers. Like, you are the bread and butter. That's who that YouTube video is for. That is targeted marketing. Yeah, but they're not. A, they're not enough of us. Like there's, I mean, it was, trending on Twitter is fine and all, but there, there, toys never brought the show here because there aren't enough of us to buy all the toys. Like, uh, it's it's a sad truth, but like the Power Ranger fandom is huge. Super Sentai is big over here because Power Rangers are here over Power Rangers here over there, and like we have we have Power Ranger comics, we have Ultraman, Ultraman's coming out, Ultraman, we have Ultraman comics. The Super Raya is putting Ultraman on YouTube for free for people to watch and stuff like that. But Toei, there's not enough of us, I don't think. I mean, I hope I'm wrong. But I think, I mean, like, the, the, the thing about, like, geek <clears throat> shit, though, is it's so niche, right? Like, everything is niche. Not, it, it doesn't have... It, it, Kamen Rider may never be, like, mainstream the way Power Rangers is. Like, Hasbro won't be making Kamen Rider toys. But I think putting something like that on YouTube and streaming for... I mean, I think, if anything, you know... Toys understanding that there are fans outside Japan, yeah, uh, because it's huge in Japan. Like I think I I think I took pictures out of a Common Rider store when I was in Japan last summer. It was like, yeah, you want me to get you anything, Jamie? Yes. And and I did. I think I got take you some stuff. All of the store, <laughs> <laughs> all of the display items. <laughs> but like you know, but that kind of stuff is very niche outside of Japan. And the ver- the very fact that they're even you know giving you some of it. Like, we were just talking about fucking SH Figure Arts and shit like that. Like, that ain't really yeah. <laughs> the biggest market. That's why they cost $75 a pop, you know? Like, it's not like there are... You don't yeah. find SH Figure Arts in a Walmart, is what I'm saying, so... Yeah. Jamie, what this is is an excuse for you, for the first time in a long time, to troll a YouTube comment section. <laughs> <laughs> Because there are a ton of people. (laughs) Yeah, right. And you get to fucking excite like the other, I'd say, 100,000 fans who are going to see you lighten these motherfuckers up. I I low key uh, uh, direct uh, DM'd uh, Mike Dent and me and him were shit talking. We're like, just, see, what that's the fuck what I'm, is that? Put that shit out in public. Put it out in public. Um, Oh, uh, but the other thing is, I drew uh, fan art from the movie. Uh, so the the current the common writer Wait. that okay is this the titty? The, yeah, the, this the, the common titty common writer. Yeah. So there's a this this common writer can tap into the power of previous generations common writer, and a, a form shows up in the in the movie. Like one of his final forms shows up in the movie, and I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. I wonder why they didn't use this in the series proper. And then I looked up reference art for it, and and there's a reason why. It's because he has a giant tit window and he has these red tits in his armor. And it's the weirdest, ugliest fucking thing. And I had to draw no, it not. and share it with the world. No, Wait, it's not. You I know can... why? Hang on. Because while you bring this up, I'm going to harken back, call back Schumacher. Fucking <laughs> yes. Mr. Freeze with his titty windows and his little, and I don't know if you saw this before, there are little nipple windows. <laughs> like there, there's top titty windows and there's them, them little Schumacher nipple windows. So, Jamie, there's a market. Uh, let's see. There, I have to keep it here because it won't focus yeah. in on me. But, yeah, that's the, the <laughs> common writer titties. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I had to draw that. And it's the, ridiculous, the most ridiculous common writer form I've ever seen. 
and uh, it made me laugh and it made me happy. So uh, good weekend for Common Rider. Uh, I don't know if they picked up any new fans, but I got to watch it on YouTube and it was official and I didn't have to download a fan sub and feel guilty about not paying for something that I don't have access to. So it was great. It was great. Wow. You still didn't have to pay for it. I still don't have to pay for it. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, all right. On to the lecture at hand. Uh, Keith is one of our 10 listeners, and he, uh, <laughs> he listened to last week's rant about Hamilton. Um, Brandon, you had not seen Hamilton yet. No, at the time I hadn't. At, at the time you had not. <laughs> and so oh, Keith, no. Keith messaged me on Facebook and he says, uh, uh, wow, record for longest cold opening. By the way, I want to come on and defend Hamilton. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we emailed back and forth and uh, Keith is here to present a full-throated, full-chested defense of, of, of the Hamilton, uh, which I believe, Brandon Chalmers, you have now watched. Yep, watch it today. Uh, today. today. But before we jump in, Brandon, can you give us a TLDR, your feelings on Hamilton? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Are you done with musicals forever? Yeah. Are you looking for I, I, a rent? Just, just, some, just some more context, too, because like one of the reasons I told Jamie I wanted to be on the podcast is that like Brandon was like, I hate musicals like period full stop so i was like yeah. Yeah, someone needs to be on here to talk about no, and, <laughs> the and, beauty of musicals <laughs> and i and i double and i double down on this but i also rebut that i said this in the last episode and i say it again now and i say this about a lot of things that people enjoy some of these things just aren't for me and there's nothing wrong go out and join musicals fucking watch them have a fucking tramp stamp of rogers and hammerstein put it on your fucking don't, back don't like, do that don't, live don't your don't best that, life man. like oh. what like fuck that good. mikado shit no don't do that <laughs> but like enjoy that shit you are not the very model you're of not a modern major general me. no fuck that shit. <laughs> <laughs> but like you're not gonna catch me giving you a hard time about it but also don't expect me to get super <clears throat> excited about it which is why i hadn't seen hamilton until today because of what we were recording and I thought I should actually be part of the conversation and not be a fucking curmudgeon who just goes, I didn't want to see it. I don't like it. Because like, yeah. <laughs> right. I don't want to be every fucking douchebag who looks like me on the internet who has no context or understanding, <laughs> just complains about something. I, I personally still don't care for musicals. Now, credit where credit is due. I was genuinely impressed with the acting. I love the mixtape. So it's not the music that I genuinely dislike. The set design was fucking outstanding. And the transitions that they did were hot as fuck. Like when, the, when Hamilton's talking to, uh, to the sister and then the wife comes spinning around and they got that fucking seamless transition, I yeah. was smooth as shit. Yeah. Like credit where credit is due. Now, with that said, I still don't enjoy musical as a medium. It's not my jam. Like, did you did you watch it with the current administration or did you watch it solo? Uh, I I watched it with the current administration. She <laughs> she insisted the second she found out I was watching it that we <laughs> that she watched it with me because I think she wanted to see my reactions in real time. Oh, nice, cool. Had she seen yeah, it yeah. before? Oh God, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So she's into yeah. it. No, no, she's super into it. And like like I said, there's a lot of things that she enjoys. I, another prime example: of this Chira. The, the okay. Netflix show. I have I no issue it. with that yeah. whatsoever. I know that's not my jam. I'm not going to watch it. Doesn't mean people shouldn't watch it. Doesn't mean you shouldn't enjoy it. Doesn't mean you shouldn't have a fucking fandom of it. You shouldn't show kids. A fucking rad. Cool. I'm, I'm glad. I love Noel. Like, I'm super happy that she's succeeding, and I'm glad people enjoy it. It's not my jam. It's also, I don't feel like it's written for me. So the idea of me not liking it, ugh. Like, I'm, <laughs> that's Okay. Like, yeah. that's okay. That's actually a really healthy thing about fandom that I wish more fandoms did, right? Because this is something I've talked about. Again, plug for the Hard Knock Life podcast. But this is something that, you know, we've kind of discussed in, in recent episodes. Too. And this, you know, is related to the Schumacher thing. And I yeah. kind of was relating it to the prequels and, 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 you know, knowing that just because it's not for you, 
you don't have to shit on it and you don't have to be accusatory of people who do like it, right? Because that's the thing us fanboys used to do, right? Like, if you like the Schumacher movies or if you like the prequels, you're just stupid. And let me tell you all the reasons why The Last Jedi <laughs> oh sucks. My God. The amount you know? of hate that I have received from a certain Baron Vaughn can fucking keep his opinions to himself about <laughs> the prequels. Like, yeah, all right? <laughs> and I love him dearly as a person, but no. Like... <laughs> Truffle oil eating motherfucker. <laughs> like, I, I'm allowed to enjoy the things I'm allowed to enjoy. Now, if we get into a debate about why I like it or why you don't like it and we're having a conversation about it and you disagree with me, cool. Like, red, I got no problem with that. Like, I'm good with that. And that's why, like I said, I wanted to understand it so this way I had a point of reference. So I don't want to make any of the conversation moving forward as if, Anyone thinks that I'm some sort of fucking curmudgeon or that I didn't appreciate it or what have you. Like, that is not the case. Now, mm -hmm. knowing that I still do not care for musicals and I've seen Rent and Cats and Sweeney Todd and oh, a bunch of others. Rent? Just, oh, God. Oh. Look, man. Like, I, I am not we, a fan of Rent. Oh. Well, and here's the thing is, like, I've also seen a bunch of, like, uh, the Team Star Kid shit that, uh, that's real popular. Like, I've sat through a bunch of those because friends have asked me to. If I don't enjoy all of those different backgrounds, I think just musicals aren't for me. That's okay. The Pearl so, Jam musical, on the other hand. Fucking <laughs> if, right. <laughs> if you and I want to sit down and pen even flow, I am fucking here for that <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, <Yeah>. Anyway. <laughs> It's gonna yeah, be. I'm, it's gotta be I, a grunge. Can't sing anymore concert. because then, then Sony or whatever is gonna be like. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, but it's, gotta, shut us down. it's gotta be a full grunge thing because you gotta have like Chris Cornell in there. It's it's gonna be a heart wrencher. It's just gonna fucking kick you. Oh yeah, it's gonna dick. be like it's it's quiet yeah. uptown times a thousand. It's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not a dry eye. Yeah, but with like fucking bomb ass guitar solos and shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like now. Mike McCready write it. Yeah. yeah. God. Let's now. Double, I want to see that. Back. Fuck this. Boy, that's what I'm saying. Anyway. All right, so now let's, let's double back because Jamie had some strong feelings, but you asked me specifically. I am a history buff, first and foremost. Now, I understand that the story of Hamilton and I understand that Lin-Manuel Miranda has also gone on record as saying that he was very liberal with jumping around of timelines and what have you. And, like, so, and I'm expecting that anyone who is actually listening to this has seen this. So if we end up getting into topics and I spoiled it for you, Jesus oh, Christ, I don't know. So what yeah, Aaron Burr shoots, Aaron Burr shoots Hamilton. Like, no, like, no, no, no. I'm like talking about literally, spoiler. No, 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 no. I'm talking about like beginning fucking scene where they've got Lafayette and Hercules and all them. They're not all in the same bar. He didn't meet them in the same, there's right. like four years. Yeah, he, he, and, he and Aaron Burr were not friends when they were teenagers. Right. And, and, and this is, I think, my issue with it. When I walked away from it, there are, I have to believe, a lot of people who are under the impression that that is a vamped up and musically set story of what actually happened to Hamilton. And I think that is where my issue comes is, it, the best way I can describe it is, that is a bard's rendition of Hamilton's life. They run fast and loose with the story For to be sure. able to make a better cognitive story to then create this larger than life character a ton of it is is pulled from real life and you know like so i get that i have no issue with that and i don't want to be one of these guys where i get into like all of the historical inaccuracies like, okay mm. fine but i wonder if it actually sparks enough conversation after the fact to do the research and get into other historical shit or if it is strictly living in a bubble of people who are like, I understand the story of Hamilton. I saw the musical. <laughs> like, well, so I think so. The reason I wanted to come on is to talk specifically about that, and okay, uh, the, you know, this idea that like Hamilton being this historical document and it, that it needs to atone for all of the sins of American history, right? Because I think that was yeah. Jamie's biggest biggest problem with it is that you have this musical, and and not just Jamie. One of the biggest criticisms of Hamilton is that ironically even though it casts people of color in all of the roles it whitewashes history and and i think that i mean there's valid criticism yes you know the uh, hamilton and his contemporaries are not as abolitionist as the musical makes them out to be yeah uh, on the other hand like to to brandon's point like 
it wasn't that Hamilton was not, didn't have some abolitionist streak in him, right? Like he did write about the, the horror of slavery and so did Jefferson. Like they, he wrote about it and he oh, didn't practice it. As right. Much as, but, which is, but which Jefferson's is part of the initial, point. Right. But Jefferson's initial version of the fucking declaration had notes in it that would have actually set the forefront for abolition. He was talked out of it. Right. Exactly. That's what I'm right, saying. Like, so like all right, these so, men were contradictions. Like, right. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's kind of where my question is, is like, I, I wish that in retrospect, and I understand that is a very loaded statement, that the way it was marketed is this is a fictional take on Alexander Hamilton's life based on true events. I think, but here's, the, here's where I come from that, because again, that is one of the main criticisms of, of the show. And I think there's two things. It's it's a time capsule of like 2015. Like it's a time capsule oh, of the end of the Obama 100%. administration. Right. Because watching it in 2020 is very different than watching it in 2015, 2016. Right. Because, because part of, part of like it's reclamation of patriotism for people of color feel, hits different in 2020. Right. When we're talking okay. about like really, you know, questioning the, these, these, American mythologies that we built up over the last 250 years. And that's my main thing is that it's not to your point, Brandon, I don't think Hamilton bills itself as this. I don't think it it's, it's, you know, I I don't think it's even, you know, subtext. I think it's the text. When you walk in and you watch Hamilton, you know, you're not watching a historical recreation primarily because a Puerto Rican guy is playing Hamilton and a black man is playing George Washington and an Asian woman is playing his wife, right? Like that is the, the, the meta text is the text. I, I think oh. that's where I may end up drawing a line, though, because in my thought process, one, ob- for obvious fucking reasons, I have neither the understanding or capability to be able to watch Hamilton from the perspective of being a person of color, nor can I really understand in that aspect in 2015 when things were much rosier under the previous administration and today I lack the context and capability of being able to understand it. The best I can do is see people that I care about going through this and try and empathize and educate myself with that said though, I wonder if history doesn't fucking change and the story is still the story. And are we looking through it then with rose colored glasses at the time? Was that kind of the idea is like, I, I, I think it's more of a, were people who were way excited about the idea of like, yeah, they cast Hamilton with an entirely diverse cast and that's super great. And then stop there. Like it's almost this performative sort of thing. And I think if you don't bother to spend the time to actually learn about history, you're missing a ton of fucking context. Yeah, I mean, I think to your point about, or your question about like, how was it marketed? Like Lynn, Lynn, Lynn said a lot in 2015, 2016. And he's telling the story of then. He's telling the story of America then with the America now. Right? Yeah. Like, and, it's, and it's placing people of color at the foundation of America. Yeah. And I think the, the, thing, the thing for me, the way I wrap my head around it, because again, you know, you could argue that that's still whitewashes history because there, it's not like there weren't people of color at the founding of America. It's just that right. he's not telling their stories. He's telling the stories of these, you know, great, quote unquote, great men. And I think yeah. that's where I circle back. And, you know, you mentioned this is the Bard's version. And I think Shakespeare is actually a great analogy because like Richard III and Henry IV and Julius Caesar didn't happen the way Shakespeare told those stories. Right. right for sure yeah and 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 hamilton is kind of like that it's he's not telling the story of american history he's telling the story of american mythology okay and for lynn to get you know criticized for lionizing uh, these men i mean he's not the first person to, to like turn washington and jefferson into myths you know like that's the whole that's whole that's the whole american project this is like no i mean put these absolutely. men into marble and and that's why we're tearing them down now right which is interesting yeah and i think by <laughs> putting but by putting you know people of color like you are like i think you can't avoid that that inherent contradiction and i think that's part of the premise because yeah. if, if if hamilton was cast like accurately with all white people yeah then i feel like then it's 1776 with hip-hop then it would be the the HBO version of John Adams, yeah. just set to a beat. 
Right. Well, that's what I mean. Like, there was actually a play about the revolution called 1776. Right, Which yeah. gets referenced in the show, right? When he sings, sit down, John, which is, you know, that's from the uh, perspective of John Adams. But it's, you know, it's a historically accurate version yeah, where they're all I, singing and dancing about the founding of America. And, mm-hmm. and I think, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. you're automatically, like, you're automatically subverting that idea by infusing it with jazz and hip hop and Broadway and, and putting people of color at the center. Cause again, like it's, it's, it's intentional that you don't cast white people in those roles, except for King George. Like that's right. the only role that, and even then, like there've been non-white actors who've played King George right. you know, in, in the various runs of the show. But, but, but I mean, that's, in, that's, in that, in that context that. there, yeah. Right, but in that context there, that was really hammering down the difference of culture and that actually made a lot of sense. Like, yeah. it was a statement on top of everything else. So, like, I, I got... As I was watching it initially, the, like, the history nerd in me was getting really annoyed with the whole thing. And I'm like... <laughs> That's not how that happened. Why are so doing this? Because it makes me question, like, does it change your opinion about the story if you knew that he ran so fast and loose with the timeline. And ultimately, like, that's, that's really the question for the viewer to decide. If I look at it, like you said, like a King George, sure. Like, I, I never question whether or not Shakespeare was historically accurate. I never fucking care about that. Like, I've, I'm never a British history buff. Not my fucking cup of tea, quite literally. So, like, <laughs> the, that's totally fine. And like when I was watching this initially, weirdly enough, I was thinking about a couple things that, that happened. The first one, because um, I'll end on the light one. The first one was that I was hearing all of these things and I was realizing how historically inaccurate they were and I was getting really fucking annoyed. And then I realized <laughs> that, uh, one, I was being a shit, but then it, it reminded <laughs> me of something that was really kind of pertinent. So I have, uh, recently I've been going back and showing the, the current administration, uh, all of the movies that they have missed over the time, right? So we watched Black Dynamite the other night. And <laughs> it is fucking great to rewatch and it's a ton of fun. But when they are in the community center and they have the politician up there speaking after the representative of the community, the representative of the community, uh, you know, definitely giving the message that the people need to hear, but in a really boring way, then the politician comes up basically rhymes a few things and kind of gets everything across and everybody's like, oh yeah, okay, right on. And then they're leaving and Black Dynamite like pulls her aside and goes, half these people don't know what the hell you're talking about. At least they can put his to a beat. And it made me question like, am I being a little bit misled by the idea that they're just performing this really, really well and I'm just supposed <laughs> to just be like, yeah, fuck it, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think like, I think in the context when the show came out, it was the, the first time your typical Broadway audience had conceived of hip hop in a high art form. Cause before that, like that that audience, that very, very homogenous audience would discount hip hop as like stupid, terrible, lazy, easy music to listen to. And all of a sudden they're they're confronted with it in their face and they're like, Oh, maybe hip hop isn't so fucking bad. And I feel like that was a real revelation for some of those people. I don't, I don't think it was because I literally thought about what you had said with that. And then I fucking heard Burr's words from the fucking show. There is nothing that the rich people love more than slumming it with the poor. And all I could think of is up until this fucking point when it's on Disney plus and kids are able to actually fucking watch it who can't afford to go to that. That is exactly what is fucking happening. They are literally on holiday. Remember how we were talking about Jamie forever ago where you get like a cultural representative where you take these like yes. Midwestern fucking people and you yeah. put them into a culture that they don't understand. You just be like, Hey, look, so hang tight a second. I'm going to explain this to you. That is exactly <clears throat> what a feels like it is like it's like a really toned down version of hip-hop where you're just like hey kids so here's some hip-hop about some people that you recognize we all really like george washington now let's set this to beats and all these white people are like fucking this is good <laughs> Carol, i like hip-hop i think i like hip-hop now <laughs> and then they go find the black eyed peas record <laughs> right yeah <laughs> right <laughs> like I mean, I give, I mean, again, as the resident Hamill stand on this, uh, on this here podcast, I think I give Lynn a little bit more credit because he does, you know, I mean, the homages he makes are 
a little bit, you know, go over the head. I mean, again, some of the some of the references. I'm sure the folks sitting in the Richard Rogers weren't weren't getting like they didn't. Well, know, yeah, like, they didn't know about making the a mock commandment. reference. <laughs> they didn't know they were, he was making a biggie reference. Yeah, you know. Uh, but I mean, I think to 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 that point about like what Hamilton represents, and I think it was Lynn kind of breaking through what is a perceived Broadway audience, right? Because yeah. because to before i mean up until that point like and still to this day broadway is a very stodgy white affluent and very you know elite group of people because it's only 15 blocks in new york city to see a broadway right. show right and not everyone can do it and and you know hamilton was one of the pre you know first shows to do like you know ham for ham which is allowing people setting aside like ten dollar tickets for people uh, they did this whole edgy ham thing, and then he's like Batman. He puts ham on everything to <laughs> edge ham. <laughs> he's got the the ham, the ham smoke ham. <laughs> I'm good with all of this. <laughs> Honey baked he ham. This, <laughs> <laughs> he had this program called Edgy Ham, where like they would bring students from like New York City public schools and let them see the show for ten dollars. Yeah. yeah, and and the fact that they're putting this on Disney Plus democratized. I mean, this is one of the reasons why there's so much discourse about Hamilton today than there was five years ago because as as big of a hit as as culturally you know uh uh like permeated as it was four or five years ago like the level of discourse in 2020 is is like at a fever pitch just because there are more people who have watched hamilton in the last two weeks right and that was then in this show's entire run that was actually my biggest argument against it because in my view hip-hop is the music of the people it it doesn't take a lot to to throw on a beat and to make a rhyme, like you don't need a guitar, you don't need an amp, you don't need music theory, you don't need to learn scales, you don't have to rosin a bow. You you can you can just beat on a table, spit lyrics, and do that. And to to take the music of the people and to perform it for this very very isolated group, even even with all the stuff that he did to try to open it up to more people, I felt like I, I felt I felt like it. I don't want to say it wasn't enough, but like. I don't know. I felt like it. It. It was a. As a. It was a big contradiction. Like the. Mu- you're taking the music of the people. You're blasting it for a very specific audience. But see, I, that's another in, place where I disagree because I feel like all of the inst- like we need to be in all the institutions. Like we can't just say that's an institution for elite white people and we don't need to be yeah. there because that's where like people like when uh, April Rain did the Oscar so white hashtag and people were like why you, you know that's not for us that's for them why you want to be like no we want to be there too. Mm. We yeah. want to have our. We want to be in the room told. where it happens. <laughs> we want to be in the room where it happens. Exactly. No, it's true. And I yeah. think like to dismiss Broadway as just for like old. I mean, as someone who actually loves musical theater, I think I'm. You know, I don't want The King and I and South Pacific to be the only representations of Asians on Jesus Broadway. Like, Those two can as, as, fuck as, off. It wasn't a great. It wasn't great, but I'm glad that Allegiance was on Broadway, even though yeah. the, like the songs weren't that great. You know. But like that, and because that was a musical by and for Asian Americans, you know, mm-hmm. and something like Hamilton, something like you know, Hades Town now has a very diverse cast, and it's my favorite show. On Broadway. But even then, you still can't get tickets to these shows. No, well, you can't. No, and that's what I'm saying. Like, especially now, but like you can't get access to these shows. And until Disney Plus happened, there's a huge swath of the community that 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 have heard about this five years ago that right. have forgotten about it because they, they were never able to access this show. And listening to the soundtrack is one thing, but actually seeing it is another. And if you weren't in the New York area to get access to like those, those times when they opened it up for other people to go in, and if your community theater isn't putting it on for an affordable rate, you've never seen the show until now. Yeah. And I, and but you know, and, but that, that's true of everything. Like we were talking yeah. about Pearl Jam earlier and a Pearl Jam ticket you know, Fucking, again, no. bands can, can bands can tour is 150 yeah. bucks. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, so I think any any form of like, I mean, even going to the fucking movies is not cheap. And and I think like, I mean, it's not. I'm not saying that you're wrong about you know the elitism of a Broadway show again because it's it's so like specific, right? Like, if you want to see a show on Broadway, you have to go to New York City, which is not cheap. You have to stay in New York City, which is not cheap. You have to buy the ticket, which is not cheap. And yeah. it is very limited and very elitist, but you know, again, like I think the it's so a medium that pe- people who don't live in New York City love. Like people, people listen to cast albums, people watch bootlegs on YouTube because they love the they love the medium. And and I think yeah. it, it, as a you know as a genre itself, it, it's 
it's worthy of the praise and it's worthy of like again to Brandon's point the fandom and if you love it you love it and I and I you know I think there are ways to democratize it, putting it on Disney Plus I think they deserve the credit to do that because it's not oh, like sure. Hamilton is a uh, uh you know like a thirty year old sh- like if they put like you know the Les Mis anniversary concerts are always on PBS and no one gives a shit you know what I mean like Cause well because that's I think it's that's because it's PBS though. <laughs> but that's what, but you know what I'm saying like PBS has this has a has a uh, a series called great great performances and they'll occasionally show a Broadway show right and, I, and no one gives I, a shit because those shows are older like they're not Hamilton and for Hamilton to be on Disney Plus I think I I genuinely think if you put those shows on the same medium that they can watch fucking Iron Man you get a real different response to that audience yeah, yeah. put that shit on PBS and PBS is meant to be old white people shit. That's what I'm saying. Like that, that, that's what like Hamilton being on Disney Plus, yeah. being on a streaming service for like millions and millions of people, right, opens that up and democratizes I, that. I, I, just, I, hope I, so. I wonder if you if you put other musicals, live performance musicals that are recorded on Disney Plus, and they start actually doing this with a bunch of other musicals. I wonder if you could actually open up musical theater to a lot of people who weren't initially watching it. That I, you know, I think it's a I think it's, and the, here's the thing, I think it's a boon for Broadway, right? Like, if yeah. you get, if you, if people start watching these shows, because they're all recorded, like, all the shows that have played yeah. for the last 50 years, they, there they are, I mean, archives of them in Motherfucker, New York City. Motherfucker, what are they, why are they sitting on them? <laughs> like, well, part of it is, part of it is, is, is union things, part of it is, oh. you know, like, you have to, like, the contracts that are signed, and, and you, because, like, to watch, you could watch like literally every Broadway show from the last fifty years, but you have to go to the archives in New York City at the public library, and you got to sign these forms, and you got to watch them in the library for research purposes. Fuck, dude. But but and there's there's a lot of like stories about this ever since Hamilton came out, and like why don't they do it? And it's a lot of it is contracts, a lot of it is is those actors stuff. deserve residuals. But, <laughs> well, that's the thing, right? I think this is this is what I think. Hopefully, Hamilton opens the floodgates because the other thing that Hamilton did unlike a lot of Broadway shows, is that they, they had this kind of like revolutionary residual contracts for the original cast. Like, you know, because most, most players on Broadway are day play. Like they just do the show and then they got to, you know, hustle for the next show. And then, you know, but like the, the entire original cast of Hamilton is making bank off of that show f- for here into perpetuity because of the oh, contracts yeah. that they signed. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? And, and I think, you know, the other thing that I'll, and I'll stop like, you know, standing for Hamilton and, and continue, let you guys continue the podcast is that, you know, opportunities for people of color on Broadway are few and far between before Hamilton. And this, Definitely. you know, this turned Leslie Odom Jr., Philippa Sue, Davi Diggs, Oak Odadawan into celebrities and superstars who are on like talk shows and, and, and shit. So like, you know, they can now demand top billing at, on their next Broadway show or they're moving to Hollywood or whatever. So like, I think that, you know, for all of all of the things that it, that it gets wrong, you know, and it's, you know, lack of talk about slavery, it's, you know, fudging with the timeline of American history. And, you know, people gave a shit for casting non-white people in these roles five years ago, right? Like, oh, yeah. I'm sure. How yeah, can yeah, you yeah, make yeah. Thomas Jefferson a black man? Like, because I wrote a bitch. Because <laughs> I improved yeah. him in every possible way. He's better now. He's better. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Jefferson couldn't yeah. dance like that. Fuck no, off. Like no. <laughs> he couldn't spit a rhyme like that. Shit. No. And his hair was terrible by comparison. Yeah. So no, I, that's all I want. I mean, I just wanted to like, you know, give the other point of view of, of uh, what it did accomplish and what, and what ceilings it did break for people I, from, from the fan base of that, that follows it to the, to the actors on stage. I think it without, if, if not for Hamilton, I don't think, we would see diverse Broadway shows yet. Yeah. You know, I, we'd still yeah. be like wanting. I think also the thing that I'm now taking away from it um, as a whole, and I think this speaks true of any sort of historical event brought to cinema stage, what have you, is it has to be done in a format that is palpable for a large majority of people. And sometimes that means that things are going to get overlooked and obviously looking at it with the hindsight mirror, we can't really do. So let that shit go, which I will absolutely <laughs> give you 100%. And like I said, I don't, I don't want to shit on it. It's, it's a, 
from historic nerd perspective, I'm like, Meh. and then at the same time, I'm like, <laughs> is everyone looking at this like a story? And if they are, rad. I am super behind this. But fuck it. I, so many fucking people are uneducated about historical shit that like, at least they get the premise kind of right. So we're a fucking step closer. Um, the one thing I did want to cover that they created and I want to adopt can Congress adopt the rap battle format? Yes. <laughs> yes. Can we get this? The issue done? on the table. The issue on <laughs> the table. Those are my table. favorite like, songs. Those are my right. favorite songs. Because I guarantee you, you want to make politics interesting again to absolutely rebut and ruin my own earlier point of setting your tone and your point to a beat. If we actually had that, where a prerequisite of you getting fucking elected is knowing that you can fucking spit. I am here for that shit. I want that. The floor represent like the floor recognizes the senator from New York, the RZA, and him just walk up and go, ladies and gentlemen, bong bong, and then fucking start into his point. That would like, be so great. C span would be amazing. It would be fucking amazing. Like you want to get people interested in shit? Have someone shut someone else down and then have them immediately rebut. Yeah. Like, so much better. Yeah, for sure. So much better. <laughs> yeah. I, th so. I think one other thing about your point about uh, historical accuracy, though, and, or, or like your worry that people are coming into this uh, ignorant of US history and kind of like their takeaway is that like they rap during cabinet battles in the 18th century. Uh, for the record, that is not what I assume people would take away. <laughs> it, it's my, that my he ripped off at Alexander Hamilton when he wrote the Ten, ten Crack Commandments. Yeah. But yeah <laughs> it, it's, it's a lot of like, Hamilton was this, you know, champion for the poor until he ended up getting rich. That's not fucking true. And, you know, Jefferson was this really suave shit who was really for the people and wrong about it. That's fucking wrong too. So like, the, there's a ton of context that you missed. That does you does really Jefferson come off? I mean, I think Jefferson only comes off good because David Diggs is so amazing. I think Jefferson. Fair enough, but like <laughs> Jefferson shows like as a up. Person. Yeah. Well, yeah, I get that, but he shows up with so much fucking pomp, circumstance, and swagger that it takes a good 15 minutes for you to realize that this guy's actually a shit because you're so excited about that fucking entrance that he made. You're just like, hey, hey, this guy's back. Right. Yeah, like Jamie fucking dancing over there. And it's like, you get fucking excited about that shit. And I, so, I, but I think the, where I was going with that is I think the, the assumption going into Hamilton is that you do know American history, right? Because again, you, you're confronting the viewer with people of color as these people, right? As these historical figures, like that cognitive dissonance is the point. So if you're going in, I'm not, and I'm not saying you're thinking like, you're saying that people are going to come away going like Aaron Burr was a black man. Like, I'm not saying that, no, yeah. but, like, but like that, like there is an assumption that like, you know who these men are, you know, their foibles and their contradictions. And we're going to present them that way. And, and we're going to put it in your face by casting people of color in these roles. I think that's like, there's already that assumption. And yeah, you know, you might not have known that like, you know, Hamilton was this age when he came to New York City and he wasn't friends with the Lafayette, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lafayette as a teenager. But I think like those liberties are like for t what you said earlier. That's how you tell the story. Like you got to, you can't just like bring in like, because he had like before it went to Broadway, he had Ben Franklin in it. He had John Adams. Like he had all of the founding fathers right. in it, and he was like, I have to like cut some people out. Yeah, yeah I no, can't that, really tell the entire story. That that makes a lot of sense. But I, I asked the question now hearing you say that. I, I had a friend of mine who when the Beetlejuice musical came out, right? And this was very big in a in a small niche market. And if Jamie, I don't know if you've heard the soundtrack of it or anything else like that. Okay, so you're are you're familiar with the movie Beetlejuice, correct? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, say it one more time. Say it one more time, Brandon. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, no. Beetlejuice. <laughs> no. Um, so motherfucker. They, <laughs> um, so one of the songs is literally him going through, walking through the audience talking about being dead and it is heavy handed and browbeats <laughs> you constantly about what it is. And this is like the opening fucking number that he performed to the goddamn Tonys. And the idea being that you as the white affluent audience sitting down to this show wouldn't have any idea what Beetlejuice is. Okay. 
fine, fair. I would argue that that same audience understands these names are recognizable and that guy's on money and that's as far as it goes. And I don't actually think that the audience is educated despite being affluent. I mean, I'll, I'll grant you that, but I, I think, like, <laughs> like, again, I, I, think- I, wish, I wish that they were. And I'm glad that in this conversation, we are all relatively educated about this thing to, to varying degrees. I'm sure you probably know a fucking ton more about this stuff. Cause you've been watching it a ton and like getting interested in it and what have you. But like, the the idea that everyone who's watching this or more importantly a large majority of people who are watching this or sitting down and watching this have an idea of who these guys are i don't know i think genuinely if you ask most people who were the founding fathers they might get three of them (laughs) i don't think most people give a shit about hamilton though right i uh, think I'm gonna plug Hard Knock Life one more time, and please do um, the the most recent episode is a bonus episode because it was actually recorded four years ago in 2016. But I actually moderated a panel uh, at the at this uh, like exhibit I curated in the um, in New York City for the Smithsonian. It was basically like fucking. You want to pick that name up? What's that? You want to pick that name up? Smithsonian Asian Civil Movement had me curate an exhibit uh, in New York City. And um, so the, what I curated, though, was it was this culture lab and, and I, mine was just one part of it. But I curated this kind of reading lounge where uh, we, exhibit, we put up art of like fan fiction. And I had like, you know, Jamal Eigel and, and Larry Hama collaborated on a Karl Barks type story, but they, they you know, reimagined it. The, the, the idea was to take um, classic genre fiction and reimagine it with people of color so like of course okay. they did an asian american iron fist uh story um john jennings did a black doctor who like and that was the art we we exhibited on the walls and i didn't get no I, call i didn't get no phone call <laughs> uh, sorry it's this is four years ago jamie that was four years that was before. you were you were swimming it with your knew me through. four years ago what the fuck <laughs> sorry jamie mm. Um, mm. but anyway uh, now I feel bad. <laughs> um, I, maybe I reached out and you were busy. That's what mm. it was. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm yes, not working with those motherfuckers call. again. <laughs> Jamie, take it from depressed Thor over here. He definitely called you. Like, there's no way around it. No, you were, you were, you were, you were complaining about uh, a, a certain uh, mutual doing an exhibit for him. I think, and I was like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not touching that. Oh, was I in the middle of that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, if I was yeah, in the middle of that, sure. that's different. <laughs> yeah, that's different. Now that's it makes fine. sense. That's fine. Anyway. But um, anyway, uh, we won't, we won't put that dude on blast because I love him. Um, but anyway, so but the so the fan fiction being kind of like and and fan fiction specifically about like reimagining these like you know American myths with people of color, and we talked about Hamilton in that context, and this was 2016 when Hamilton was still just on Broadway, and you can listen to that and uh, you know put the link in the description below if you want, Jamie. But yeah, yeah, uh, link, link that, it, send me the link and I'll put it in. Yeah, in that episode we talked about essentially Hamilton's fanfic, right? Like. Lin Manuel Miranda read Chernow for sure, for sure, biography yeah. of Hamilton. And that's, was like, that's exactly what me, it is. Let me imagine. Let me let me retell this. And my head canon is, you know, uh, Hamilton is a immigrant from the Caribbean, and I'm a play him, and 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 they're going to have like, you know, hip hop bat- rap battles yeah. to like yeah. settle their beef. That's right? exactly, like I think that that's was exactly what it is. Hell inserting yeah. people of color into. And again, it's the fanfic of the mythology, not the history. Because yeah, okay. what we've done as Americans for the last 150 years is tell ourselves this myth of who we were. There right? it is. That's what Mount that's, Rushmore is. That's, 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 that's there's, everything. I think that's everything. There's, there's the, uncomfortable, the, the uncomfortable part that I think that was bothering Jamie and that concerns me yeah. is that right there. Mm-hmm. He's subverting the myth. He's not, he's not subverting the history. He's subverting yeah, the myth. That's that it. These, these great men created this country out of blood, sweat, and tears. And that's all it was. And, and the actuality is, no, these were men who were petty as fuck. Yeah. Who, who mm-hmm. you know, cheated on their wives. And super who, rich. <laughs> were, were, yeah, were, 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 were like elitists and... and owned you know, like, people. Owned people. I mean, yeah, slavery does... It, it's not like slavery is completely ignored in the show. Like, there is, you know, discussion of it. And you guys talked about the mixtape. Like, Lynn put out... The, there was supposed to be a third cabinet battle which was all about 
the issue of slavery, but he cut it. Mm-hmm. One, because it just kind of like, you know, I mean, understandably, just like it was just this fucking boulder in the middle of the show. <laughs> We're just going right. to stop everything and debate yeah. slavery as much as we kind of want it in, in, in hindsight, like in the middle of the show, it's just been like a fucking bummer. You know what I mean? Uh, I'll be right back. I really have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> that is a first. This is a first. I know. You guys usually go for like three hours. Right? Yeah. So I will be right back. You guys can keep going. Uh, and if it's good <laughs> stuff, I will leave it in the cast. And if it sucks, I'll take it out. Uh, but I will be right back. Health and safety I break. You don't edit anything. I was no, going to say, it's adorable that he thinks he's going to edit You, you this. two could shit on me for the next <laughs> 20 minutes. I'll be right back. <laughs> Cool, so the headphones are also fuck Jamie Noguchi right out of the gate. Let's just get that right out there. All right. So let's talk about Pearl Jam. Let's talk about yeah. this Pearl Jam music that we're going to write. Yeah. That's, let's that's go ahead really and shift gears to, to literally we're going to have the Pearl Jam. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> or, or what I think I think you said it should actually be Seattle, the musical, and then, and then we could talk about Lane Staley and Chris Cornell. And oh, Chris yeah. Cornell. God. Yeah. <laughs> I... Oh yeah. How long do we follow that timeline though? Like, so you got to start, I guess, late eighties with like mother love bone. Yeah. I was going to say Andy Wood dying and, and, Oh, yo, we could write this musical, right? Like it starts off like, with mother <laughs> love bone. Andy right. Wood has, his OD, it's Andy Wood, right? I think so. Is that the, uh, the original singer? No one's going to correct us. It's fine. Keep going. Yeah. yeah. I, I thought you said it was, a, I thought the Venn diagram was a circle of Pearl Jam. I, I, and I can guarantee you, they are all fans, but also will not know that answer. Like, I feel confident <laughs> I know my audience. So the first, the first number is a, is a Mother Love Bone tribute song. Okay. Andy dies of a, of a, you know, OD. And then they got to find a singer. And that's where we have Eddie show up on a surfboard. And, uh, you know, and we can we can we can uh, we can fictionalize it. I know you don't like, like uh, <laughs> fudging the timeline, but maybe he and Kurt Cobain were teenager friends. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you really need to do that. Like you can have them all like hanging out that way, like local club. Like honestly, what you could yeah. do is base the whole thing around a rock club, yeah, and set well, the whole know, thing up that way. Friends, though, right? Like Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, Pearl Jam were friends. Right. Nirvana actually was kind of separate from them because they weren't they weren't necessarily part of the same Seattle scene. Like right, like, like Cobain and Cobain was kind of a separate entity from that 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 big like you know Mud Honey, um, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden. That that was like definitely like a click. And then like Nirvana was on the other side of town, so you have you can set up some sort of conflict with like Kurt Cobain not not being part of the uh, <laughs> the in group. <laughs> You know, I, like you got I, Chris I love... Lane and Eddie kind of like, you know, it's like, it's like Mean Girls, but uh, Kurt's on the outside. <laughs> okay, so, so hear me out. So we, we call it a dissident <laughs> and we set it up like a West Side Story spoof where, where either you're in the Pearl Jam camp or you're in the Nirvana camp because that's oh ultimately what God. ended up happening anyway during the grunge era. Right, right, You had right. to pick one. The Sharks and the Jets. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, with we're guitars. writing Seattle the musical. Ah, I'm here for it. We're leaving that in. We're leaving that in. I missed it, but we're fucking leaving it in. Yeah. Yeah. I like, and literally if, if we call it dissonance, it can literally be the definition. It can like the definition of the word can be the tagline for it, lack of harmony among musical notes. And it's <laughs> literally just them battling with each other and not being able to get along, even though this scene is so niche that ends up becoming this like blossoming flower that is shared with the rest of the music industry. And it's perfect for a musical because everyone dies except Eddie. And Eddie's like, the, he sings the final song <laughs> about oh, like shit. survivor's guilt. Yeah. Essentially, you know? yeah. Oh man. Like, you know, Kirk, Kirk goes at probably at the end of act one, Chris and Lane go some somewhere in act two. Yeah. And then the last song is like, you know, it's like who lives, who dies, who tells your story, except it's Eddie. Yeah. Who lives, who dies, who <laughs> And Chris, Chris Novoselic becomes like a MAGA dude, you know, it'd be great. <laughs> you know what would be great? Is that what happened? Did he? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, yeah, he, yeah. He went the 
the non-rock way. <laughs> yeah. So, so here's, here's my theory, right? Is the end scene is them doing hunger strike, right? Where it's Eddie on a lone stage <laughs> with the spotlight. Yeah. And then when the Cornell thing happens, the guy who played Cornell is dressed oh. all in white on like the rafter in the back. <gasps> it's like Jesus Christ superstar. Them. He's just in the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And then, <laughs> yeah. Now I'm crying, and dude. I don't Eddie, know. Right. And it's literally Eddie talking about being hungry because he lost all of his friends. He doesn't have that desire anymore. <sighs> Yo, Shit this is a jukebox. On. Like, this should be a jukebox musical, and we just get the rights to all of those songs. <laughs> we don't got to write any new shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Like, you know, yeah. No, we don't have to write a goddamn di- Place different, you know, that, grunge hits throughout. That is, the, that is the perfect song to end it, because you had this, like, solo guitar doing those and doing it's like, those it's, And it... It'll be like a reprise of like it'll it'll have play, it'll be like the Act Two opener. Right? Yeah. Oh like yeah. Soundgarden and Pearl Jam's big Temple of the Dog thing. Yeah. The right. interstitial music is gonna be gonna be that like. Oh. Fuck but then it comes me. back at yeah. the end. But it's like in minor key, so it's like even more oh, depressing. See, and we could do it in in both of the second act, like in, in the halfway point, right after intermission, and then at the end. Because if you do it in that time when he's still alive, like that's how basically they end his life from that point. Right. The first time is literally like i don't mind stealing bread is the label taking all of the money from the band while they're just oh. getting just hosed oh. yeah so now it has that double entendre meaning yeah yeah uh, i think we just wrote the musical gentlemen how do we <laughs> okay, do now is how do like we get, get the ha- rights keith you know people how do we make this happen <laughs> see i don't think i know the right people for those two hours ago i was like outing myself as a pearl jam fan i don't think i know the right people <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you have to out yourself as a Pearl Jam fan. I still well, don't this is what that. I've learned in the course of this podcast. Like, who yeah. the fuck are you hanging out with that hates on Pearl Jam? <laughs> You'd be surprised. Mm. You don't need those people in your life. Yeah, you don't, you already don't, cut them out. You just come here. Uh, yeah, Marty, good. Come, come here. Yeah. <laughs> I've, 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 I've found better men. This is yes, yes, you have. Yeah. 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 This is the yeah. house that you know, house that Jimmy built. We accept everybody. <laughs> Yeah, look. Just look at those people. Tell them, don't call me daughter, and move the fuck on. <laughs> you deserve that. shades have gone down. Yeah, <laughs> just put them in the rearview mirror. I can keep going. Like this is fine. Ten. Something with off ten. he goes. Oh <laughs> God. Yep. Oh man. <sighs> I'll because I'll, 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 I'll take it. I'll I'll do some like deep cuts off like newer albums. That's so much. <laughs> <laughs> I hear sirens. Oh man. So oh. y'all don't even know what I'm talking about on sirens. No, 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 no. <laughs> but look, that your was best like, man. That's, like, that's, that's that's some load reload new sane anger bullshit to me. That's they're talking crazy shit. That doesn't yeah. exist. You know how you and I were just kind of hanging out when Jamie was talking about Kamen Rider titties? That's that's your Kamen Rider titties. That's, that's yeah, what it that's, is. Yeah. Mm, nope. Pearl Jam's later later era albums. Yeah. Yeah. No, we that the musical don't go that deep. <laughs> yeah, we, we we're gonna well we're, we're, ending, we're gonna end it with the shit that people know so we get the money. Yeah, we're we're <laughs> yeah. ending in a. Yeah, like the well, did, the whole did, story stops after Vitology is really what it yeah, is. Exactly. All the songs yeah. are going to be yeah, just from Vitality. So are the songs just Pearl Jam songs? The, the, the Pearl, we won't actually have like Alice in Chains songs or you, I mean, I think we, you need the whole. You need everybody. You need the a, right because it's See, Seattle the musical. It's not yeah. Just if, if, yeah. Well, I mean, if you do Seattle the musical, that makes sense. But also, you could totally just do the Pearl Jam one. Use their like catalog the soundtrack to do itself it. is just the yeah is just Pearl Jam right, and then you tell the story of Seattle from their perspective. Mm-hmm. Is is you show all these guys and then you talk about them basically being put into this battle in between them and Nirvana that they never wanted and Eddie never really wanted and, and being able to be like projected onto this thing where it's like I you know pick a fucking song that we can do and and figure out what it is oh I and just then, had another idea though like yeah what if the final song isn't uh, uh, hunger strike and it's Eddie alone on a stage singing an acoustic version of Alive. Oh, that's singing, good. I'm oh, still that's alive. super good. Oh. oh. I would also accept Black as well. Sure, yeah. Like, which is the just the best song in their catalog, and it's got to right. be in there somewhere. Yeah. 
And then we'll have hip hop heads in the audience reacting to it. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> they're they're the first they're they're the first people we invite to the opening of the show. And we yeah. just put a we put a camera on them the entire time just, we say, like, you can be as loud as you fucking want. The, yeah. This is a rock club, so you yep. you react as loud as you want. We give them all. Yeah, we, we literally put like a like a GoPro on a Bob Dylan harmonica <laughs> mount and yeah. just have them go, yo, <laughs> whoa, time out, yeah. stop. Did you just hear that fucking lot? Did yeah. you just hear that fucking lot? All right, keep going. Bring up, keep going. <laughs> See, that's that's what theater is missing. That kind of like live re- interaction with people just saying like, holy I, shit. I would argue maybe it doesn't actually need that. <laughs> 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 Well, wasn't it, wasn't weren't there stories of like some of the some of the performances of Hamilton where people were like singing the lyrics with the people yeah. and dancing in aisles and stuff? I mean, that's the kind of show I want to see, like people getting yeah. into that shit. Yeah. Agreed. Fucking no, I, mosh, I think I think we got it in the middle. A fucking I, mosh I, pit in the middle of it. I th- I think we did it. Yeah, like, I, mean, I, I don't know if I learned anything musical. really about Hamilton, but we definitely cast a Pearl Jam musical, so my work's done. <laughs> We're like, done. I, yeah. I, 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 I should leave the cast more often. <laughs> wait, I can't wait till you like, like you know, listen to the playback and and hear our first opening act. Like, I think <laughs> I'm I'm not gonna spoil. It. I'll let you listen to the playback. I'm excited. I mean, I how need we started. To, I need to fuck it. I'm gonna storyboard this shit. <laughs> You got the I'm gonna release break. a mini. I'm gonna release a gash can, uh, ash can comic of this shit. <laughs> That's how we're gonna pitch it. We're gonna go to some somebody with a, a shit ton of money who knows Pearl Jam. We're gonna give them this this ash can. They'll be like, I see it. I love it. I, let's make. Honestly, it. let's go straight to Pearl Jam. They were the one who cut out Ticketmaster. We just exactly. tell them, hey, it's time to break into a new venue. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Who? Who? I mean, they're old enough now, right? To do. The you gotta know somebody who knows Eddie. Yeah. yeah. I wish I knew someone. If I knew someone who knew Eddie, I wouldn't be talking to y'all motherfuckers. <laughs> Damn! <laughs> Damn! I mean, I mean, like, look, I wouldn't be slumming it with that. This white guy? No, 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 no. I got a much higher tier. <laughs> I got a much dude, higher tier. White you, you know yeah. Marvel people. You know an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. I do. Uh, well, I don't really I don't really know. <laughs> I did a panel with this five years ago. <laughs> You say that, but I bet if you contact and then be like, yo, can somebody get me Clark Gregg's number? Because I feel like he probably knows Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, who, who's, like, again, I didn't think anyone was, like, Pearl Jam fans other than, like, you know, hip-hop heads on YouTube. Are you kidding? <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> who hurt you? Like, yeah, <laughs> seriously. I mean, like I said, I always just assumed people thought they were, like, corporate. You know, I, you know what it is? It's, I grew up around Nirvana fans, maybe. Oh. No, you don't need that kind of hate. No, 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 no. I mean, I like Nirvana. I don't have anything against Nirvana. Either, no, Nir- like, Nirvana's thought- fine, but... <laughs> I think you know, it was overblown I- that, like... And, and the funny thing is, like, you know, you had Nirvana on fucking MTV complaining about Pearl Jam. It's like, you're both selling... You're both there. Records. <laughs> you're both there. <laughs> like, yeah, what? I, what you're do you you're doing an unplugged session. You're there. Yeah. <laughs> now, here's here's one. Uh, so this way, if we end up getting any, uh, any hate mail, it'll definitely come in my direction. Uh, I'm glad that Nirvana ended early, and I'm happy that Foo Fighters are there instead. They're a much better band. All right. Yep. Gonna make my stance. You can go ahead and at me. I'm good. Uh, you can find me on Instagram <laughs> at that guy Chalmers. Jamie, where can they find? Uh, where can they write an email to tell me to go fuck myself? It'll only be for Michael Brocco, but I'm happy to read it. <laughs> he doesn't watch our show. Uh, you can reach us. <laughs> no, when I when I tag him and tell him how much I'm shitting all over Nirvana and the tail end of the show. You, know? uh, you can find. You can email us at info at fucking do it cast dot com. Uh, I checked before we did the show. We don't have any new email. So, God damn it. But we are open to believe you. We are ready. Boss, to where can you. they find you? Uh, I am on Twitter at the real chow, the underscore real underscore chow. And you can follow the Nerds of Color at the Nerds of Color. Go to hardknockmedia.com to find all of our podcasts, including this one. And uh, I'll be looking for you singing some Pearl Jam tunes. Yeah, I'm going to fucking, I got a guitar. That's, yep, <laughs> that's the, that's the next half of the podcast. <laughs> Jamie, my fucking Noguchi, where can they find you? Uh, Twitter, Angry Zen Master. I do not recommend it, but I'm there. <laughs> I'm I this am close to like deleting it off my. Phone. I am there. <laughs> uh, it, it is glorious to delete Twitter. <laughs> yeah, uh, Instagram, Jamie Noguchi. You can see my common writer titty window. 
uh, YouTube. Where where we find this, you'll find me. Just put my name in Google. I'm, I show up places. Fuck it. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Brandon, where can Jamie. people find you? I already said it. You can find me on Instagram <laughs> at that guy oh. Chalmers. It's the only fucking place you'll find me because I'm not <laughs> participating in Twitter. Fucking thing's a cesspool. I don't want to be there. Uh, all right. Anyway, uh, uh, so, yeah. So yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, uh, that's it for now. Everybody go find some music you enjoy. Hey, you know what? Fuck it. You heard it from me. Go watch Hamilton if you haven't seen it. It's, it's fucking good. It might not be my jam, but it's real fucking good. Yeah. I just wanted to be on the Zoom where it happens. And I'm See? Glad you let me. <laughs> I was going to do that shit. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for one of you motherfuckers to do that bit. <laughs> Keith, Keith was not going to throw away his shot. He went for no. it. Oh, God. Went right for it. <sighs> He must be out of his goddamn mind. Okay, I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs>